Doesn't show. He's Lou. We can't hear you. Uh, I think he's, he's still coming on. It takes a while to get on after he's. Um, yeah. yeah, he should be on now. He's just muted. Okay, we're started the meeting. You're on, Steve. Okay, welcome to the uh, board of directors meeting for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, convene the meeting. And Holly, if you want to take the attendance. Roll call. Hi, I'm sorry. I don't see Lou Ferris on the um, meeting. Is he here? I'm right here. He's there. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Um, D President Swan? Here. Director Henry? Here. Director Foles? Here. Director Moran? Here. here. Director Ferris? Here. Great, thank you, Holly. Uh, uh, Rick, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? I have none, uh, I'm an, and I'll ask District Council, do you have any? Uh, this is District Council, I have none. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this portion of the meeting is uh, reserved for the public to ask any questions on items not currently on the agenda. So you may, uh, may speak on, uh, on any subject you want that's not covered tonight. You have uh, uh, three minutes to do so. And, uh, and we'll be using that as a standard timepiece for all questions going forward, even on the agenda items. So they have three minutes to speak on anything and we will try to limit it so that you speak once on a topic and that's all. Um, we wanna try and get through these four items. It's a special meeting. So we wanna be uh, efficient with our time and, uh, and move this along so that we can accomplish all four of these items and get back to our air conditioned other rooms. Uh, does anybody have any comments uh, about something, anything not on the agenda? And I think it's CTV or the people watching for hands being raised, correct? Okay, not seeing any hands coming up. Then uh, we'll move on to the uh, existing items, old business, as it were. Uh, one thing I'd like to do, just to get it out of the way, uh, Rick, I'd like to make a change and take the uh, letter to Pacific Gas and Electric first and just so that it's done or dusted. So would you like to address that? Sure. Uh, yes, uh, Council Nichols, is, does that require a motion or we just can move to that item? Uh, it does not require a motion. The uh, board chair has the authority to uh, change the order of the agenda. Okay, so that'll be uh, item 5D, correspondence to PG&E uh, regarding PG&E's uh, wildfire um, mitigation plan and tree removal. Um, the recommendation is that the board review the memo, um, provide direction regarding the attached revised letter to PG&E regarding tree removal, and PG&E uh, wildfire mitigation plan. At the February 20th, uh, 2020 Environmental Committee meeting during public comment, a request was made on behalf of the Valley Women's Club Environmental Committee and friends of the San Lorenzo Valley Water to write a letter to PG&E addressing impact to the watershed by PG&E's tree removal program. A letter was drafted and brought to the board of directors on March 5th. Uh, staff uh, received direction to work with Nancy Macy of the Valley Women's Club to update the letter to reflect the, the districts more uh, specifically. At the April 16, 2020 board meeting, Director Foltz introduced a revised version of the letter included in this agenda packet. After reviewing both letters, uh, the board uh, decided to move forward with Foltz's version. Uh, staff uh, received direction to work with Director Foltz, Director Moran, and Nancy Macy to uh, finalize the letter. Uh, the final draft, the C Exhibit A, 
uh, and a list of the recommended recipients, Exhibit B are attached. And I'll turn it back over to the board. Thank you, Rick. Does, uh, does anybody on the board have any questions about the revised letter that uh, Bob worked on with, uh, I forget who it was, Nancy or somebody else? Or anybody Nancy, Nancy and our environmental program. Uh, oh yeah, Carly, uh, right. Worked on it with them yeah. too. So does any board member have any I, I do, but I don't know how to. You did, you're fine, Lois, just shout it out. Just uh, okay. let us know you're here. What's, uh, what's your comment? Um, I think this was a failure of proper procedure. The original letter at the last meeting, and I didn't realize I was approving for it to be written by another director, but it was originally from the environmental committee. It was written by a board member who was part of that committee. It was written by a staff member who's part of that committee. It was also people from the public and from the committee that helped with it. And I, I won't vote. I don't care if the new letter is the best letter ever written. I don't think it was proper procedure. And I'm going to vote no. Thank you, Lois. Any other, uh, let's see. Okay, oh, I can see a hand up. Bob, you have a comment about the letter? Well, I can, uh, I was just going to say I could offer a, uh, to display the red lines if anybody needs to see that. Um, with respect to the procedure, I may be very confused, but I thought this was a letter that was introduced during public comment at an environmental committee meeting and was brought to the board for direction and given everything that's happened, wasn't able to go back to the committee, which is of course where it should have gone had we not been in this current uh, situation. And so at that point, it's um, back to the board. I, I'm very confused about the process, but uh, uh, my understanding of the process was very different. Okay, any other uh, board member with any comments about this? Um, I'll chip in a little bit. So um, it was presented by a uh, member of the environmental committee uh, during public comment uh, during a meeting a couple of months ago. And um, that's when it was first read. And then it went to the board to be uh, discussed and um, we've taken direction since then. So, uh, that's my comment. Um, and the only other thing is, uh, it, I think, uh, director Fultz and, Mar and, uh, Nancy Macy worked on it a little bit a while ago, a week or so ago. Um, I was invited to that, but I couldn't get my zoom, uh, connection working. So I didn't participate in that. But uh, it's to the extent of the letter, the letter uh, addresses things that we are concerned about. And, you know, there's many ways of expressing these same interests. And I think it expresses those interests. And um, I'm glad to see that we're, uh, you know, uh, requesting PG&E clean up its act a little bit and be conscious of what's going on here in the San Lorenzo Valley. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. uh, Lude, so you're the only one left other than myself. Do you have any uh, questions about the letter? No, I have no comments to add. Okay, Thank terrific. Thank you. I think the letter is fine. It, uh, it, it's exactly as what we ended up discussing at the last board meeting. Um, so I don't have an issue with it. Does the public wish to comment on this letter? Not seeing any hands, then we're going to bring it back and vote on this. And uh, uh, so I'll, uh, I'd like to make a motion then that we, what is it? That we approve this letter as written uh, by the team of individuals involved in writing it. And, uh, and that we, uh, we sign it and send it on to, uh, Everybody that's listed on the two list, 
attached to the uh, draft that we have in our agenda packets. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Uh, let's go for a vote, Holly. Oh, hang on a sec. I got a question. Uh, Sorry. Why, Bob, is it significant? Well, it has to do with who to send the um, letter to and in what form. So if you uh, look at the uh, second page, yeah. there's a suggestion that separate letters be sent rather than CCing one or another. And there's a list of folks here. So one of the things that Nancy, uh, Carly and I discussed, and we weren't uh, we thought that this probably needed board, specific board direction was which way to go. And so I think we need to be very specific about what we would like uh, staff to do relative to whether it's CCs or separate letters or what have you. My, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of agnostic on it, the way it's written, it's kind of written towards PG&E. Uh, so writing it to them with copies to these folks, I think would be okay, but you know, it's really up to the board which, which way we would wanna go. And I, sorry to interrupt the vote, but I wanted to make sure we were addressing this specifically. I don't know, I got a feeling we're all pretty agnostic about uh, <laughs> the letter in Bob. So let's just say that we'll direct that a, a unique copy. Let's see, we'll just send one copy to PG&E and CC all these other people. Okay, sounds good to me. That's Thank my you. motion. Can I get a second again? I'll second that again. All Thank right. You. Did you get a vote, Holly? President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? No. Director Foles? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Ferris? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. I, I voted aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Terrific. Okay. Uh, back to you, Rick. Hey, Chair Swan, so we're, we're, we're back on the agenda. We'll go back to item 5A, uh, the unfunded liabilities. It's recommended that uh, the board receive the information and the presentation by staff. There is no immediate action needed. However, staff recommends these issues uh, continue to be discussed at, at committee level. Uh, the district has been having uh, more conversations around unfunded liabilities. There are three main categories, uh, employee benefit liabilities, deferred maintenance, uh, which is large capital projects, large scale capital projects due to their past useful life, old redwood tanks, age, undersized pipelines, et cetera. Uh, there are smaller and routine projects, tank coatings of existing tanks, extending their useful life, um, routine facility maintenance, meter uh, replacement, et cetera. Some of these uh, routinely occur in the annual budget, such as the upcoming tank coatings, meter replacement, and paying of the required benefit liabilities. For benefit liabilities, there are measures that the district can take to decrease these potential um, and save money for the future. Some of these deferred maintenance can also I have a more detailed roadmap to the future. The uh, finance manager has put together a PowerPoint and I will refer to the finance manager for reporting on this item. Stephanie? Yeah, but just before you begin, Stephanie, I would really like to ex express my appreciation to the staff, you particularly and Rick and everybody else that invested time over the last couple of weeks in putting this together. Uh, <laughs> I know it took a, a tremendous amount of effort and it was not a scheduled item uh, in our normal agenda of things, but uh, your efforts are very much appreciated by the entire board of directors. So thank you very much. And with that, Stephanie, if you've got a show to go or a show to show, feel free. Stephanie, we don't hear you. Are you muted or unmuted? Hello, maybe Stephanie. She, maybe she's talking to one of her one of her two unfunded liabilities uh, running around the house. <laughs> her, phone, her phone looks muted. Uh, still don't hear. Uh oh. There you are. I heard the uh oh. 
Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My earbuds must not be working, so I will work from my phone. Um, so unfunded employee benefit liabilities. Um, so what employee benefits are there? Um, essentially, our district has two. We have our pension liability. Uh, many people are used to the idea of how retirement plans work. We have two tiers, 2% 2 at 55, which is commonly referred to as the classic member, and 2% at 62, which is called a PEPRA member, and that's for anyone that enters the CalPERS system um, after January 1st, 2013 for the first time. The other employee benefit is referred to as OPEB, other post-employment benefits. And the district offers a retiree medical benefit for employees that continue to use CalPERS medical plans after retirement. And this is gonna vary from when someone retired. So someone that retired 10 years ago, depending on what the amount was in their contract at that time is what they, is what they will be getting paid out at. Next slide. Uh, so might as well just get the cat out of the bag. Um, so GASB 68 and GASB 75 essentially were the requirements to show your long-term obli future obligation on your books. Um, as of our 630 2019 financial audit, the pension liability was at 3.8 million and the OPEB liability was at 1.1. So the district had roughly $5 million in unfunded employee benefit liability. Next slide. Um, here's some of the key terms that you'll kind of see being used a lot of times in some of this stuff. So the unfunded accrued liability, it's pretty much the present value needed to pay the future calculated benefit. Um, a lot of this all gets put together from actuarials and actuarials use a lot of different assumptions to go into their projections. Some will be demographics such as mortality, disability and retirement rates. And then they also do economic uh, assumptions for discount rates, salary growth and inflation. Amortization base is essentially similar to a, a mortgage. It's going to have the different amortization period, how long it's getting spread out over and the different rates. Um, implied subsidy, this relates to the OPEB for the most part. And this is where, again, more like an actuarial type of a thing where they, it's like a blended rate for active and active employees. We pay the same rate as the retirees would pay for their plan. So because of that, it's like the active employees are subsidizing the retiree premiums and that creates a liability that GASB requires us to show on our books. And then the net liability is just the difference between the liabilities and the assets. Next slide. So as we said, our OPEB is about 1.1 million. 60% of that is cash and 40% of that is that implied subsidy. So when people are funding their trust, if they have those created for this, you wouldn't necessarily want to fund 100% because 40% of that is this implied subsidy, which isn't something that you are technically paying out of. Currently, our district only does a pay-as-you-go method, so we don't have any offsetting assets. Um, in 2018, the district did, however, create a Section 115 trust fund dedicated to pre-funding the OPEB liability. Essentially, what it is is you're able to put your money into this trust and you're able to get better interest rate returns versus the district being able to invest our money not being restricted. So the idea is you're earning interest in this trust that's going to help you build up that reserve to pay for these future obligations that you know that you have. The nice part about these is you can get the money back. So if we were to, for example, put 50000 into the trust 
if we spent 25,000 this year, we'd be able to take 25,000 out of the trust or take 25,000 from the trust to pay towards the liabilities. So on an annual basis, if you have money sitting in that trust, it will reduce this long-term net liability. Um, so this is something that we recommend the district start to fund. Next slide. Um, so the current PAYGO method, we have seven em uh, retired employees that do utilize the CalPERS medical. We pay about $23,000 per year. Um, and so the easiest way to go to start funding this would be a matching program. That way, you know, we're paying $23,000 to the employee. We're paying $23,000 to the trust fund. If the district ever got in a financial pinch and we needed some, of, we needed that year's money back, we'd be able to easily submit a reimbursement for that amount of money. Um, and just to kind of put things in perspective, if we were to sit here and put away 23K at 5%, the rate of return over 10 years would be about a 300K balance. Um, so that would be covering about half of the cash liability. So we could take a pause. If there's board members or the public that have questions about OPEB, I'll leave it up to the chair for if we want to address questions right now for this specific OPEB portion, or if we want to just take all questions at the end. Well, I think I'd like to take the questions at the end, and I'd like to, to not try to do a deep dive on this tonight. I mean, this is a lot of material that you put together and provided it us with, and I don't know if if any of the directors or even the public has had an opportunity to go through it in as much detail with respect to all of the outstanding liabilities or, or um, unfunded liabilities that are represented. Um, I, would, uh, I would suggest then that we continue to go ahead and deal with questions at the end of the presentation. Sounds good. Um, and just to preface it for everyone, like Rick said, is specifically for this, we're not looking for the board to take any action on the employee liabilities. Um, we wanted to get the information out there. I'm assuming this will be going back to committee for actual recommendations at a later time to come back to the full board. Right. I think okay, it, so we can go to the out there was was what was critical, and, and I think you did a great job on that. Thank you. Okay, so Ian, we can go to the next slide that should uh, try the next one. One more, there we go. Uh, it's a little cut off on here, but in the packet, it should be uh, legible. Um, so now we'll go over the district's pension plan. So most state and local retirement plans have a defined benefit plan, which provides employees specific pension payments. Our pension system is through CalPERS. Um, we sit in their miscellaneous risk pool, which simply means that we sit in a pool of money with a bunch of other agencies. So it's a shared pool. Uh, we kind of already went over the classic and PEPRA. It shows that we have 16 active employees um, that are classic members, 19 active employees that are PEPRA. There's 27 employees retired. Um, that were classic and none that are PEPRA. It shows what the employer and the employee contribution percentages are. And the last line is the unfunded accrued liability from um, the actuarial report from June 30th, 2018. So that is the more, I put the most recent one that we have from that. So this will be integrated in the next year's audit. Um, so the classic is sitting at 4.3, and the PEPRA is sitting at 38,000. Um, the next slide will kind of we'll start to explore why there's such a difference between the two. Okay, next slide. Um, so brief pension history. Um, in the 1990s, pension funds were overfunded. In 1999, Senate Bill 400 granted billions of dollars in retroactive increases to pension benefits. Um, 
So everyone was sitting pretty with the dot-com boom. And shortly after they pushed this legislative through, it crashed. Uh, so now the funds went from being overfunded to underfunded. As it was starting to recover, the 2008 stock market crash happened and things just got worse. PEPRA um, went into effect January 1st, 2013. So that was a pension reform act. Essentially, pension funds would have, I, I don't, I probably would have gone completely under if some sort of reform act didn't happen to get things level loaded again. So this January occurred January 1st, 2013, and it had a much different retirement age, different things to have. Uh, it is a less favorable package to employees versus the, the classic members. Um, but it's what was needed to be able to help get pensions as a whole back to being in a little bit better state. Um, more recently, CalPERS has continued to make more changes in some of their different assumptions and practices, such as lowering the discount rate, changing um, some of the years in their amortization. So anytime they do certain, you know, they do some of these, there's a reaction. So whenever they lower the discount rate, everyone's liability goes up. And so that's kind of pension funds were doing good, certain things happen, and then that's when it's kind of created the situation that most agencies are in now. Uh, the next slide. So this is a CalPERS chart, and it's just kind of showing um, their historical funded status. They have some of the key markers showing major things that happened, um, and it just kind of helps show when it was overfunded, some of the different changes and stuff that happened to where it swung the opposite direction to where it is in such an unfunded state. Um, it has slowly started to recover. Um, but it obviously still is a long road ahead for not just CalPERS, but pretty much all pension plans. Next slide. Some of the major changes that CalPERS made is they're shortening the amortization period from 30 years to 20 years. Um, most of us can understand that relating to a, a home mortgage. Um, so instead of them amortizing what we owe over 30, it's now over 20. They are also doing level dollar payments for the unfunded liability. So agencies will have a higher initial payment, um, but overall it'll reduce the interest cost and eliminate negative amortization potential. And then they're eliminating some of their rate smoothing and ramp up and ramp downs that they used to do. So whenever they would make certain assumption changes, they would do a five-year rate smoothing, which means you are impacted by it for many years. So they've changed some of those different assumptions. And all of these will start to show up in this next year's actuarial report. Uh, next slide. What has our district done? Um, in 2016, the district did a fresh start with CalPERS to amortize our then unfunded liability. Um, instead of being over 30 years, over 15. And this saved our district, well, it's saving um, about $800,000 in interest expense. The district also does the lump sum prepayment option each year. Um, we make the payment in July about every year, and it's about $300,000 um, where we have the option to prepay it instead of evenly over the next 12 months, and it saves us about $10,000 each year. Little footnote, the district has multiple options to continue to lower the UAL. Not only is there the unfunded balance, we're charged 7% interest on it all from CalPERS. Next slide. Some of the options the district has to be able to do is to make additional one-time payments. Um, this gives the district the most freedom without being locked in. Uh, for an example, if the district chose to make 50,000 payments each year over the next five years, that would 
reduce our unfunded liability and it would save the district about $600,000 in interest over a 20 year amortization period. Um, there's always the option to regress shorter amortization periods, similar to the fresh start that we did before. Uh, you're locked in is the only downside in that. And with CalPERS switching from the 30 down to the 20, essentially they're doing part of that work for us as well. Um, and then similar to the OPEB, the district could create a section um, 115 trust for pension funds. It would work the same way. You could earn interest on it. It's nice that it stays being the district's money, um, but it doesn't do anything as of right now for chipping away at the larger balance. So this is something that would be good down the road for the district. And then the last item, some agencies go and take out a pension obligation bond to pay down their unfunded liability. Um, essentially, you're taking on one debt to pay off another debt and you're just trying to hedge a better interest rate. Um, it's actually not recommended by the GFOA, kind of for those reasons. You'll see districts that are in a dire situation that may be forced to do something like that. Um, but it definitely would be more, the district has better options than something like that. Next slide. Uh, to summarize, um, so having to show the future obligations is relatively new in the last couple of years to all public agencies balance sheets. So we're not alone. The vast majority of agencies have a large liability that showed up on their balance sheet in these last couple of years. Um, we will likely always have some liability on the books. For example, the implied subsidy portion from the OPEB and then any changes in the market, you know, you could be up a little, down a little one year. Um, we're not alone. Mostly all agencies are carrying these unfunded liabilities since everyone was impacted by more unfavorable market history in these last, you know, 20 years. Um, this isn't unique to CalPERS. There's CalSTARS. There's then there's other nationwide pension plans that are all in a similar situation. Um, what's important is that agencies don't ignore it. Um, there are proactive ways to reduce the unfunded liability, which benefits the fund overall and directly benefits our district by being able to reduce that 7% interest that we're being charged. Um, next slide. Final thoughts. It's obviously not a quick, it's not a quick process. Um, it's gonna take years of thought out planning to gradually reduce the district's UAL. Planning and dedicating funds now will slowly start to help the district's financial future. Um, that ends my presentation and like I said, is this was just more so getting the information out there, making it so the board and the public can understand the unfunded employee benefit liabilities a little bit better. And I'm assuming, you know, once we start up the committees again, this is something that we can go back to the committee level on. And if the district or the committee wants to recommend something to the board, we can always bring that back. This is the type of thing that we can do an ex budget amendment later on in the year if that's the route that the committee wants to go. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Rick, did you want to go into the uh, the tank aspects of the uh, the tanks and infrastructure for unfunded liabilities, or shall we take a pause and ask, see if we have any questions for Stephanie on the um, with respect to the pension liabilities, et cetera. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and take questions on that. You know, the the water tank unfunded liability, this is just the start of you know several sections um, in, in the operational end that the director of operation has started to put together. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, right. we wanted to bring what we had and, and start, you know, rolling it out uh, to the board. But if you want to go ahead and take Stephanie's questions first. And we do have the director of operations uh, that can uh, talk about uh, the water tank unfunded liability. 
Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, once again, so I want to remind the other board members, this is not a deep dive into any of this stuff right now. So if you got questions, make them pertinent and make them limited to the presentation and or any specific questions that you might have. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna drain this uh, material. Uh, it's it's we're happy that we've got it, and I think it needs a lot of time to review and uh, and uh, and digest before we're too uh, uh, too able to dive into it in more greater detail. But are there any comments or questions by any of the directors at this time for Stephanie? I have some questions, Steve. Go right ahead, Lou. Stephanie, I have three questions for you, if I may. First of all, do you know why or what the justification was for, for Senate Bill 400? I was not even of age to vote. I have, I mean, it was, so I, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say like what, I don't know what the political atmosphere was back then. It was, my understanding from what I've read is it was overfunded and everyone was floating on this dot-com bubble thinking that, hey, what a great way to give it back. I know that the unions back then were pushing for that as well. Um, and that's all some of the stuff that went into pushing Senate Bill 400 back or pushing it through back in the late 1990s. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number two. The total liability for the unfunded uh, liability is stands at just under five million dollars currently, and I, I'm not a financial person, so I'm gonna I'm gonna rephrase that in something that I can understand. It sounds like back in 2000, 2017, Calpers sent us a bill for five million dollars because of their monumental boneheaded decision to to lower their projections. Is that right? No, um, it has nothing to do with CalPERS. Um, it was actually governmental accounting standards that required, you never had to show what that future obligation, that future cumulative obligation is on your books. Um, so it was accounting standards that changed that then said, no, you guys should be having to show this future liability on your books now. Um, so that was accounting changes to where everyone had these before that. Um, they've had them for years and years. Um, it just required us to put them onto our balance sheet that way. Um, and then shortly after that, the GASB 75, which was the OPEB, came on, required us to put it on the books as well. So it had nothing to do with CalPERS sending us the bill. Um, people could all, you could always see what the action, what the liability was. You know, they put out these actuarial reports annually. Um, so the districts had an unfunded liability for decades, um, well, now decades. Uh, so it's accounting pronouncements, not. Cal per sending us a bill. But we were paying uh, roughly 10% into the, the retirement fund for all employees going way back, correct? Correct. So on top of that, we now owe, I mean, you can call it an accounting change, but to me, it's it's a real bill that that's $5 million above and beyond the 10% that we're sending in every month for all of our employees going back here. Correct. So essentially it's sitting here and it's taking the contributions that you're making now, losses, assumptions, all these different things and projecting out over the next 20, 30 years for what it is you're going to have to be paying out. And it's well, the difference between the, it's the difference between the projected assets and the projected liabilities that you're going to have. Well, I guess my point is, I think somebody did a really bad job of trying to project, you know, what uh, the actual cost of retirement was going to be because this unfunded liability just keeps going up and up. So my final question is this, what is the chance that we're going to have another round of unfunded liability hit us that we're going to be, you know, requ required to pay down on top of the $5 million? Well, 
So that's why PEPRA, that's why the, the 2013 PEPRA um, Pension Reform Act happened to stop these classic plans that were essentially paying out more than what the funds were realistically able to out earn in interest revenue. So that's part of why, you know, when you look at the classic plan, it's four point something million in that plan versus the PEPRA plan is only unfunded by about $38,000. Um, so that Pension Reform Act kind of is partially to undo kind of what happened back with SB 400 to reset the pension plans so that they can still be viable. So as the classic members retire out and more people are on PEPRA, it will start to get a little bit more improved. But I mean, you're going to have things like market volatility that are going to always weigh in on that. You know, it's no different than people's private 401ks or different stuff like that. I mean, those were hit majorly as well in, in you know, these different crashes. You talk about market vol volatility, but the assumption that I see on that chart is that they're still assuming a return rate of 7% on their investments. And I don't know anybody that's getting 7% today. So why do that, why, so it, that tells me that down the road, there's gonna be another a, a delta of unfunded liability added on because of the difference between 7% and what people really are getting today, which is, you know, today is just something in the negative region. I mean, it, it, they have been lowering the discount rate. They do it gradually. They don't just do it, um, you know, they don't just go from eight and a half to seven. It has been gradually getting lowered. Um, I believe they are talking about continuing to lower it, which in turn is going to turn around and make our projected unfunded liability look worse. Um, Still, the, the, the gradual lowering, but the first time it was um, a half a percent, and then it was a quarter of a percent, and then it's a half a percent. We're still nowhere near reality, in my mind, assuming a return of 7% on, in today's market. I mean, it's, all, it's unfortunately all stuff that, you know, we, we don't have control over. This is the CalPERS people that manage the program, right? That uh, set these values? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Any other uh, questions from any board member? Bob, I see your blue hand up. Yeah, thanks. And Steph, Stephanie, thanks for putting this together. It's it's really good background information. I'm looking forward to talking about it in more detail in the budget committee. Just uh, to um, follow up on, on Lou's uh, question, but what is the 15 or 20 year return on investment that CalPERS is, uh, is getting? Um, that's sort of a long-term return on investment. I, I don't think it's 7%, but I, I'm not sure what it is. It, it, it is ballpark. It's, it is right around there. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but over their long-term, and I mean, and I guess that's the thing that they always, you know, these are long-term investments. Um, so while it may not be right now, um, you know, a couple, you know, over the last couple of years, I mean, they actually had, they were surpassing the the 7%. I want to say this last year, they reported it was 6.8 um, that they got closing out, I believe 2019. Um, but long-term, you know, when you look at the long-term of it, it is roughly around this. Well, well, I I mean, I guess if you were to go back to the raging bull markets in the 80s and, and 90s, perhaps, but over the last 20 years, I mean, if it was only 6.8% last year, which was a pretty raging market, I, I'm I'm concerned that even seven is, is way too high and that this is something we're going to talk about in budget committee is what number we should be targeting at as a district, I think, in order to make sure that we're keeping our promises to our uh, uh, to our uh, uh, retired employees. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Any other comments or questions from any board members? No, not from me. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, to the public then, uh, do you have any questions or comments about this aspect of the unfunded liability discussion? Three, two, one, no. Okay, moving on. Uh, Rick, uh, James? This is um, President Swan. This is District Council. I see a few hands up in the attendee column. Yeah. You do? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, who do we have in the attendee? Okay, so I see the names now we've got. Uh, well, at the top of my list is Larry Ford. So Larry, we'll recognize you for three minutes. Okay, thank you. This is Larry Ford. I'm uh, I'm wondering what has the staff been planning to do about these unfunded liabilities? I mean, it's it's not anything new. You've been thinking about it, and related to that, I'm wondering um, what opportunities are there for grants from outside sources like government agencies and foundations and that sort of thing. And then what opportunities are there to request um, maybe, you know, with a bunch of other water districts to have some kind of subsidy from the state or federal government? Um, and if there were some grant or subsidies available, what is staff doing to prepare um, for getting some of those grants? Thank you. Um, so similar to how it's, you can't just go out and borrow money to pay this off. Um, I don't believe that there, I am not aware of there ever being discussions of grants or subsidies from the government to pay off um, the pension liabilities. The state does have a lot of their own. Um, if you look at the slide back in 2017, the state did pay in a large $6 billion from the state to pay down the state's unfunded liability. And so what that does is, I mean, if all agencies start to chip away at it, I mean, you put money in the stock market smartly, you know, the idea is that you'd be earning more money um, off of the return, you know, you'd be getting a higher return. Um, so that's where the discussion kind of starts to come in. I don't foresee there being any, you know, bailout type of thing where we'd be able to get grant money or money from the state for stuff like that. But this is where the district, you know, we made, we did the fresh start um, in 2016 and the district can make these one-time payments to slowly chip away at our district's unfunded liability and save that 7% uh, each year on that. You know, that's where the example goes where, I mean, if we smartly choose to dedicate a plan towards this, you know, five one-time 50,000 payments over the next five years, say 600 grand over a 20-year period, that number can continue to grow. If we end up having years where we have surplus money, this is a good option um, for where some of it could be spent. I mean, obviously the district has other, you know, deferred maintenance and other capital projects that it could go towards, but it would be smart to start to, to have a plan go towards these. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, next with a hand up is, uh, looks like Gail Mahood. Can we unmute Gail? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. That was an excellent report. Even I could understand it, even though I don't know much about finance. I just want to sort of follow up on what you seem to be implying at the end of your response to Larry. And if I understand it, then we've established this 115 trust to pay down the unfunded liabilities for the medical benefits, but so far, we've not allocated any money for it. And then the second part of my question is, um, it also sounds like we've not budgeted uh, this year or at any other time for these sort of one-time $50,000 payments uh, to uh, cut the 
um, other part of the unfunded liability. Is that is that am I understanding this correctly? Uh, yes, that's correct. So one of the things that we were wanting to do with this budget process, if we had it slated that we were going to be talking about these unfunded employee benefit liabilities at the budget and finance committee to hopefully get some money allocated during this budget, given everything, you know, the committees have been have been canceled. I'm hoping that we can start it up again. And then if that is the direction that the committee wants to go, the board could vote to choose to allocate funds to some of these. Okay. And if, if Dr. Director Swan will just indulge me for a second more, I guess I would like to jump off from that and, and advocate that I, I think we should restart the um, committee meetings. Um, I, I just I just think that the budget committee is gonna have a lot of things to do this year um, because of both the potential um, budget issues that might come if we have a recession and a lot of people who can't pay their bills, but also to deal with this question. I think engineering has some things that has to be done. So I, I would encourage us to go back and um, do those uh, meetings. I think the, especially the finance committee, the, the more people that are thinking about this, probably the better. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And uh, the last blue hand I see belongs to Beth Thomas. Beth, you are recognized. Hi, thank you. Uh, it was a great presentation, Stephanie. It's a really complicated subject. And I've had a lot of familiarity with uh, CalPERS and with PEPRA in my work previously. Um, and I wanted to just say, I happen to know that um, you're right. I think CalPERS was uh, estimating 6.7 return on investment for 2018-19. And um, over 30 years, they actually have had an 8.1% uh, return on, on investment. And, and I think Pepper was important because, and I was involved in <clears throat> management of a um, large union uh, staff at the time, uh, employees really took on some of that debt burden in addition to what they were already paying. The other thing that's interesting, and I'm curious to know what happened in the, the water district. During the 90s, one of the, one of the problems, one of the practices that helped create this problem is that there were uh, employer pension holidays because the because the uh, because the pension was you know at 128 percent funding they gave a lot of employers pension holidays which means that while the employees were still paying for their uh, percentage towards their retirement that the employers were not um, and I'm wondering if the water district if you know what the water district's practice was during that time and why maybe that's part of why the unfunded liability is also so high. Um, that's an easy one. I do not know what the district did back in the 90s. Okay. Were you born in the 90s even? <laughs> no, <laughs> later, later than that, but Sorry. Uh, early, earlier than that. Yeah. But uh, no. Okay. Well, that is that did contribute. I think also the SB 400, which was CalPERS legislation actually, uh, also created some additional problems because they started funding uh, some categories like police and fire got funded at 3% at 50, you know. So, so a lot of that's been improved through PEPRA and hopefully it will continue that way. But I think it's true that we're gonna see an even more difficult situation uh, for the next foreseeable future given our current situation. All right, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Any other um, questions or comments from anybody, uh, the public? No, okay, now moving on, one, two, three, three, two, one. Let's go into, um, now, was there, was there an overview, Rick, that uh, that James wanted to do with respect to the tank maintenance and stuff that with the spreadsheets that he started uh, or, or that we have so far? 
any kind of um, comments or overview that you want to make, uh, James? I have, I have to unmute there. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Jim, uh, the Director of Operations give you uh, an overview and then uh, we can discuss a, a little more of what he put together here. Uh, James? Okay, so this is very rough. Um, it's a start now. You'll see in the estimated cost of painting and coating for the 14 welded steel tanks. Um, the costs are very similar all the way throughout. I did get some costs from some neighboring districts that have done recent tank paintings and coatings. Um, the difference is, is that we don't know what is in our paintings and coatings. So that has a lot to do with the cost. Say if there's lead in the outside paint of the tank, um, the cost can go up a lot more. Uh, for encapsulating or having to tent the whole project and sandblast. Uh, so it's very hard to predict without having each one of these thoroughly gone through from a painting and coating specialist. Uh, that has not been done. Another thing you'll see is that most of these tanks have not been coated since the install installation year. This has a lot to do with the deferred maintenance. Um, and the no money to do so and being told not to do so throughout all the years. Um, a lot of our tanks are, I mean, and it could cause a situation where when we do go to do these, there will also need to be steel repairs done to some of these tanks before the paintings and coatings happen. So they'll have to, there's some of the tanks are so pitted and worn at this point that now they're gonna to have to go in and cut out sections and weld new steel in and whatever and whatnot, make repairs in some of the roofs and, and that kind of thing. So that's gonna inflate the cost also more. And that's another thing. I mean, you can't estimate that. We don't know what the cost of that is until we're get, we're, it's looked at by a specialist and that has not been done. Um, now, Blair Tank and Brookdale Tank were on the, on the, in the budget to be painted and recoated this year. Um, we have been working on the RFP, but it's been very difficult. Uh, we, this is our first time doing so. So we're trying to get an outline. We're working with, by pulling other districts' costs and how they, and their RFPs together and pulling them apart and trying to put our own together. Um, it looks like that we put this back in the budget for the next fiscal year to actually get the paintings and coatings done as we're hoping to have the RFP done soon. Uh, so this will be, those are pushed back to next year. Um, and as I said in my operations department um, thing that I did in March, presentation that I did in March, these, I want to do two tanks a year. I would like to see us do two tanks a year for the next eight years, and that would get us through all of our tanks. And then I'm, we're also looking into a maintenance program. And so with the maintenance program, after they're painted and coated, if you go on a maintenance program, the cost of the painting and coating is spread out through those next 15 to 20 years. And you're not just paying out one lump sum after 15 to 20 years. And during those 15 to 20 years, they're coming out and touching up or, and making sure that these tanks are not in such bad shape that we have to do repairs again the next time we do paintings and coating. And the life of a steel tank is forever. As long as they're maintained, painted and coated and kept up, they will last forever. Um, I'll move down. To our, uh, let me take some questions. If anybody has questions on the welded steel, yeah, I was just wondering how long does it take to do an inspection, and then how long does it take to do painting and coating? Um, the diving, diving and cleaning inspections take about four to six hours per tank, depending on the size of the tank. Um, we have one tank, like our Lion Water Treat, our Lion Tank, the three million gallon one. That actually takes almost eight hours. It takes almost a full day to do that one tank because it's so large. But they take about four to six hours normally per tank. And uh, the painting. I have a question too. 
Um, everybody's talking at once and I can't hear. Yeah, uh, just to finish off my second part of my question was painting and coating, how long does that typically take start to finish? Uh, painting and coating can take up to two weeks. Okay. Oh. Right. Yeah. I want to interject in here too on, on, on the paintings and coatings on a couple of these tanks. One of the big concerns on the single tanks is that we have to keep customers in water and there's quite a bit of prep and work to be done to move storage around and to continue keeping folks in water. The, the Brookdale tank for one is a major hub and it'll be a significant project to keep folks in water while you're paint, doing these painting and coatings. Is that included in the cost that's referenced here as far as the two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars for painting and coating? I don't think so. That'll be done in-house. That'll be a staff staff project. Um, but we are doing the inspections and cleaning. Paintings and coatings are different. Keep in mind we are on schedule with uh, with underwater, with wet inspections and vacuuming, you know, silt and and uh, and rust or whatever uh, deposits out of the tanks. That's, uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, that is up to, up to, uh, on, on schedule. Or yeah, those, those dates are also in this spreadsheet, um, yeah. the date of last inspection. And we have had repairs done to some tanks, underwater repairs to some of the coatings inside. We have done touch-up painting to the outside of some of the tanks. But it's not, it, some of these tanks are, and in the inspections are said with some of the pitting and deposits that are out on there, they're gonna need repair. Okay. And it's time to get on top of it. Right. Can I say uh, something? Actually, uh, Rick was first and then you, Lois. Oh, okay. I, I don't know how to contact well, you. So. so Rick, go, Steve, go right ahead with your. Her too, uh, Lois. Go ahead, Lois, if you don't mind, oh. Steve. I have a simple question. I see that Big Steel is 80 years old, and you're saying it's going to live forever? Yes. Or indefinitely? Tank. Yes. As long as that tank, we continue to maintain that tank, it will live forever. Wow. And there can always be, I mean, and if it needs repairs, we go in and do repairs. They can do steel repairs on steel tanks. So the whole tank isn't you know, destroyed. There'll be parts and pieces that are destroyed that'll be repaired. And, okay. and Big Steel has been modified and upgraded through the years. We put, when we first had Big Steel, we bought it used from Lockheed. It didn't have a roof on it. We came in, put a roof on it. It has had paintings and coatings. And then we came back and put stairs on it. I mean, Big Steel has been maintained. So it's a big tank. Over a million yeah. gallons. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Rick. Okay, uh, thank you, James. I, I just want to echo some of what James said. Um, I worked as a house painter for more years than I'd like to think. Um, and uh, planned maintenance is what keeps costs down. And to the degree that we're doing that, and I, I hear that uh, Rick is, there is a schedule for periodic inspection. Um, that's the whole key is, is staying ahead of any major repairs. So I'm, I'm glad to see that we're focused on this and um, it definitely needs to be a part of plan maintenance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob, you have a question or comment? Bob, did you hang up? You're still muted, Bob. Yeah. Uh, sorry, my internet connection is a little unstable right now. Am, am I coming through clearly enough? Yes. Yes. Steve, can you hear me? Yes. Bob, we can hear you. Bob? Okay, well, uh, hey, Steve. Maybe. Steve. Yep. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So sorry about that, guys. My internet connection went a little uh, went a little wiggy. Um. So am I coming through okay now? Yes. Great. Uh, James, thanks very much for putting this together. I know this represents uh, 
culmination of a, of a lot of effort in your part. And I think it's really great that we're starting to really understand where we stand with tanks. Uh, a, lot, a lot of this tank maintenance is, is way, over, way overdue for sure. And your advocacy of making sure we take care of this is really appreciated. Um, I had one question about the inspections that are done. Are those inspections, which I see that we've uh, kept up on, um, does, do those inspections include an examination of whether or not repairs are needed and where those repairs are needed in the tanks? Yes, they do. And like I said, um, they, we have done repairs. Like recently, we did some repairs in Brookdale tank to the coatings and the outside paint. Um, and they do tell us, they give us a very detailed dive video with audio and they point things out and all that and show us where the pitting is and whatever and whatnot. And we definitely try to combat it, but it's not, without doing the full painting and coating, it's not com combating the whole situation. No, per perfectly understood. Thank you for that. That's great information. Okay, uh, do we have any uh, questions from the uh, public for? Or, Steve, or I have a question. Questions? Who? Blue? Oh, okay. Blue. Blue, I have two questions for James, if I may. Sure, go right ahead. James, uh, looking at your list, uh, if I take the average estimated cost, I come up with a figure of around $10 million. And that's, that's obviously a, a floor, not a ceiling, but does that sound about right to you? Um, actually, I came up with, uh, I, have, I actually went through and did estimated totals for the whole total at the bottom of my spreadsheet. It's not on the spreadsheet that I delivered. Um, and it came out to about 3.5 to 4.8 million is what I got. Well, that's even better. Uh, my second question is, since oh. we're, we Lou, Lou, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, you're right because that's you're talking about the total over everything. Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. But I'm just the welded steel would be three point five to four point eight million. Okay. And my second question is actually uh, for all types of tanks, and that is, if we if we find out when we do the inspection that there is repairs required and not just uh, painting and coating. If we get to a certain level of repairs, I would assume that it would make more sense to replace than to repair. And if that's true, um, is there any thought given to if we have to replace a tank, upsizing it? I don't think that any of these tanks are so bad that they would be need to be fully replaced besides maybe one. And that would be the Bear Creek Estates tank, the 75,000 gallon one. And that would also be a pl place to put to put a bigger tank if we ended up doing something like that. But all these other tanks, I mean, I don't think it's bad enough to where we'd have to replace them. I think repair to go in, re do the repairs and paint and coat them, and then put them on a maintenance schedule. That it's going to be the cheapest cost to the district. All right, and thank you. If I can, if I can interject into Lou's question, anytime Lou. And for the full board, that we replace a main line, a tank, a pump is looked at for today's standards in the pump for flows, fire flow, storage, uh, we uh, to upgrade. And we upgrade wherever we can and wherever we have room. And a good example is the Redwood Park tank, the swim tank. The new site is allowing us to put the state standard fire flow of 125,000 gallon tank in. We always look at it. And once the master plan is done, we'll be able to run that much, much quicker. And um, fundamentally, we'll be able to run each one of those zones and do flow tests and so forth. So to answer your question, we always look to upgrade when possible. Good, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, public? Okay, uh, the first I see is uh, E.J. Armstrong. If we'll take E.J. off mute, there we go. E.J., you're back on mute. Can somebody take him off mute? There we go. Okay, how about right now? There we go. So far, so good. Yes, uh, thank you for this presentation. I really 
uh, am interested in the tank issues, having been involved in a number of issues involving tanks over the years. Uh, my question is regarding thermal imagery. Has there been any attempt to do thermal imagery around the uh, exterior surface of the tanks? Because there has not. That could tell you a lot about what's going on with the steel. Good to know, there has not. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, Fluke Industries has some uh, technology available to do that. It's very sophisticated and can really uh, give a good analysis of the characteristics of the steel and indicate the points of failure. And that uh, could be costed out well in advance. That's my question, my observation. Um, very, Thanks. Thank you, um, we will look into that. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, next, Mark Lee. Mark? Let's take Mark off mute. You're still on mute, Mark. Mark. You're still on mute, Mark. There, there you go. Okay. Please, I uh, appreciate the uh, presentation uh, on the capital facilities maintenance program on tanks. Um, and I'm glad that uh, they're keeping costs uh, contained where needed and where it's advisable to spend money. I like that approach, it's incremental. Other methods for looking at cost uh, steel uh, deformation or leakage is through x-ray uh, technology also used in the industry. So that may be something to look at. But uh, I think the fluke industry uh, model is, is excellent because it does look like it does use uh, uh, photographic imagery based on heat sensing and various uh, dimensions of the metal uh, from the whole uh, from various angles of the tank. So it's used in metallurgy, actually developed in the aerospace industry for weld certification. Anyway, appreciate it. I'm glad it's not 10 million per year versus 3 million uh, over the over the lifestyle life cycle of our existing tank inventory. Can you hear me? Yep, thank you, Mark. Okay. Appreciate your input. Anybody else in the public have a question or comment for James? No, okay, was there, uh, we took that pause. James, was there more you wanted to uh, address? Yeah, so I wanted to go down to, I wanna to go to the bottom of the spreadsheet now to go, go to the uh, bolted steel tanks and talk just a little bit about these. Uh, most of these are not that old. Obviously we have the spring tank, that's kind of an older one. And we don't have the data, the Charlie tank and it's kind of an older one too. But the other three are fairly, fairly new. Um, I'm not quite sure of the understanding on the painting and coatings on these yet. Um, what we have done though, with the bolted steel tank that we had at Blue Tank, it was deemed um, failed. It had a buckle in it from an earthquake in 89. And so when we, what we did was a refurbish and replace. And this, on these bolted steel tanks seems to be a lot cheaper than going with paintings and coatings to do a refurbish or replace. Um, the cost was not significant. It cost us right around $250,000. Um, we used the existing pad. We didn't have to put a new pad in. We just had to put some new pegs in around the pad to make it earthquake strength or up to standard. Um, but these are these have been a good thing for us. These bolted steel tanks and Nina tanks, we've been getting those inspected. Um, and the S the cost of inspection is about the same. And that's and we estimate that at a total of 1.3 if we have to refurbish and replace. And then I will touch on the redwood tanks. Obviously, most of our redwood tanks now are in process of being replaced. Um, with uh, six tanks that are going in out in 
Lompico, and then the swim tanks being changed to the Redwood Park tank site. Um, we'll eliminate those two as well. And the Felton Heights tank is also in the process with easements and stuff to be replaced as well. Um, the other five that we have on there that are not in process, they're technically in process because they're Redwood tanks and they're noted to be taken out of our system. Uh, but no plans and specs have been done on any of those other five tanks. And the echo tanks are all at one site. So that's why the cost of that is kind of, it seems like replacing three tanks would cost more, but it's one site. It would end up being one or two redundant tanks to at the same site or a different site. So that's where I came up with that cost. And these are just estimated costs that I came up with. Okay. The, uh, the, the Felton Heights tank that's just in the process of being replaced, is it being replaced with a significantly larger tank? Yes, that tank is being replaced, I do believe, with a... It, it'll, be, it'll be sized for that area, 125,000 gallon tank to have fire flow and so forth. Oh, terrific. Yeah. And we're Again, getting an easy... we replace a tank or any type of facility, we try to bring it up to the, to the engineering standards of today. Gotcha. And we're and that's another one that we don't have the, the room at the existing site. So we're just finishing up negotiating with a different property owner for a large enough site. And that's why that one has taken so long to do. And we'll be coming to the board with a uh, proposal in the next month uh, to move ahead on that project. And that tank is also funded from the Lost Acres community. When we took over that community, there's a payment that they will have to start making once we start making progress on that project. That's partially. 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 Yeah. Small part. Small part. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of it's funded, but I know some of it's funded. About 75 grand. Had it been installed a few years ago, it would have been mostly funded. There we go. <laughs> so that's my presentation on my spreadsheet and like I said it's a very rough spreadsheet um, there's a lot of work to do still and we will keep adding to this there's a whole there's also three concrete tanks that I don't have on here and there's a multiple poly tanks that I don't have on here poly tanks don't take much for um, maintenance besides inspection and cleaning um, the big thing is, is once they, if they get hit a weathering lifespan, they start to maybe crack or something like that. That's the expected. And to replace a poly tank is not a significant cost. Great. Thank you, James. Appreciate Good it. Good work, James. Any, uh, any questions from any of the uh, directors for, uh, for James on the, this particular subject? I got one, Steve. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, so James, a few meetings ago, uh, you put up for bid some of the scrap redwood, salvaged redwood from one of the tanks. Did you ever, did we ever get a sale on that or what happened there? So what happened there is I had my whole bid pack and everything all ready to go out. And then we hit this COVID thing. And they, they have to come out and look at it and stuff. And it's behind locked gates and stuff. And we didn't want, we were told not to interact with public, not to interact with things. So I asked the district manager if I should be moving ahead with that. And we came to the conclusion that we shouldn't move ahead with that until this order is lifted. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, okay. Any, uh, any questions from the public? And I see a hand from April, April Zilber. Okay, I hope I'm unmuted now. You are, April. We Excellent. Um, loud and clear. That was a very interesting presentation. And I just have a question as a person who's kind of clueless about this. When you need to replace a redwood tank, do you replace it with a different material, such as steel? Yes, the majority of the time they're replaced with steel. Um, we have replaced some of the redwood tanks with poly tanks. 
uh, for because of difficult access or no project ready to go when the tank failed. So we go in and there's some of these sites that have poly tanks or we're just temporarily put poly tanks in there when we took down the redwood tanks that failed. Thank you, that answers my question. Thank you, April. Uh, I see Mark Lee. Go ahead, Mark. Yes, uh, following up on our uh, discussion on deferred maintenance on the tanks, um, the uh, larger capital projects are still, it's a dynamic, still a, it's not set in stone. We're still working on the fine details on deadlines and budgets, correct? This is still evolving. Can you hear me? I don't know if I have the answer for that. I would say yes to that question, Mark. We are still, uh, James and the engineering department are still putting together the spec on, uh, on paintings and coatings. We are incorporating a lot of inspection into the new painting and coating specs. Painting and coatings have changed a lot over the years especially uh, with um, lead paints and, and so forth and the new coatings. So and that's what slowed this process down this year is putting together that, that new spec. So, so we, have, we still have further chances down the road to comment as the public uh, and ratepayers here to look at the evolving uh, maintenance, deferred maintenance on, those, on, ver on the total tank population for the district, correct? You should be, yeah. The engineering committee would review specifications uh, and um, and contracts um, and projects. That would be done in the engineering committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other uh, questions from anyone in the public? Any directors? Last shot. Three, two, one. Moving on. Okay. Rick, back to you for our next agenda item. Rick, you're muted. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Okay, this will be item 5B, the Low Income Rate Assistance Program. Uh, it's recommended that the board receive the information and the, uh, we'll have a presentation by staff. This is meant to be a guided discussion to help pre present different options. Depending on the discussion, the board may direct staff to proceed with uh, developing a program. Uh, the public water agency's rate revenues are subject to restrictions under Proposition 218 and 26 that essentially prohibit utilizing those revenues to subside a rate assistance program. The district has discussed using non-rate revenues or a donation program to potentially fund a low-income rate assistance, like a LIRA, a LIRA program. Uh, the presentation will hopefully guide discussion around the most feasible uh, option for our district. At the April 16, 2020 Board of Directors meeting, a local group following uh, its health friends of the SLB Water submitted a proposal for board review, and it's attached uh, in your packet. And at the April 16, 2020 meeting, the board directed staff to bring the subject back uh, to a special meeting uh, for, uh, for further discussion. With that, the finance manager will have a PowerPoint uh, and we'll take over and present that item. Stephanie? Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so, low income rate assistance program, can go to the next slide. Uh, so, essentially, we need to figure out what is the district's ultimate goal. Um, personally, when we're talking about developing a plan like this, I like to think about the viability of the plan that something like, you know, is something like this a plan that the district wants to have for years to come? Um, obviously, pros and cons to everything. So, first idea is to create a long term program to give discount on bills monthly. Um, you know, this for a monthly discount on a bill, it would likely need to be an internally ran program. Is the plan to create a one time relief for customers in need? This could be an internal or an externally ran program. Uh, do we want to create a temporary pilot program for the more immediate future until AB 401 is formulated? 
Um, and then if there's any other reasons that board members can think of that, that may fit into that. Uh, next slide. Uh, who's going to run this program. So depending on the type of program we pick is going to start to point us in the direction of if we think it's going to be an internally staff ran program or an external. Um, internal, there'll be different options, constraints and costs that we can have if it's ran externally through a third party, like a 501c3 that we partner up with. Um, some of the questions we may, may want to ask ourselves is how much control or input would we have um, in that situation and how important is that to the district? This would obviously have a lesser uh, impact on staff if customers are directed to go to a third party to get, to get something. So one of the things we'll want to weigh is pros and cons for an internally ran program versus an externally ran program. Next slide. How is it going to be funded? Um, is it going to be district funded through non-water rate revenues? The district does have property taxes, mobile lease revenue um, that would not have some of the same restrictions as our water rate revenue. Is the district funding through customer donations to the district or a combination of the district could do their own donations as well? Um, is the district partnering with a third party for them to receive the donations? And again, similar situation to weigh the pros and cons of that. Um, one of the pros for if it was a 501c3 uh, company is it would be able to be a tax deductible donation uh, versus if the district were to be the ones accepting donations, it would not be. Uh, and then some of the other pros and cons in this situation would be if it's a set amount versus an unknown. So if the district were to be donating a fixed amount through um, some of our non-water rate revenues, we'd be able to set an actual dollar amount versus if it ran purely off of donations. Um, that can also get complicated because what if you don't have enough donations one month or one year? And next slide. I, I asked Gina to put together a slide explaining AB 401. Um, AB 401 was adopted in 2015 and required the State Water Resources Control Board to take the lead in developing a LIRA plan by 2018. Uh, they finally released the report uh, just a couple months ago in 2020. She lists out some of the different highlights. You know, they acknowledge that local agencies are going to have a hard time coming up with money on their own due to Prop 218 and 26 constraints. Um, and they were rec this SWRCB was recommending that it be a statewide program, uh, recommends the 200% poverty level, similar to what PGE care program bases their stuff on discusses direct water bill credit, renters water credit, and crisis assistance, recommends using state income tax and taxes on bottled water for funding. The next step is for legislature to consider the recommendation. Um, since it involves creation of new fees, it will take a two-thirds legislative approval vote. Um, if it gets immediate traction, maybe beginning as early as 2021. So, and I mean that, you know, from the conversation Gene and I had, that's an accelerated. Given the COVID pandemic, we think that there may be a chance that they do look to accelerate this, but either way, we are talking about a year plus out. Um, and so that's kind of where my, one of my previous slides was saying, do we want to set something in stone now? Do we want to do a test program? Um, with AB 401 coming down the pipeline, it may be soon to where we are told essentially what it is that we have to do. Um, we just don't know quite yet. Next slide. And this is some of the things that I think we'll want to keep discussing. I'm assuming this is going to be going to a committee as well. Um, inter internally ran program thoughts how much money each year, fixed versus variable. Um, if it is a fixed amount, that'll help us set the number of applicants allowed. 
Um, if funding is reduced, how do you reduce the applicants enrolled? Uh, what will it take to run the program internally? Probably a pretty high volume the first year. Um, as far as setting up an actual discount on a customer's bill for a monthly program, that's relatively easy for us to do. Um, then there'd be ongoing annual renewals. We strongly suggest that we piggyback off of the pg e Care Program. Um, it is what a lot of other agencies do as well. Um, but overall, well thought out policy needs to be developed. Um, and then other smaller things like how heavily do we want to advertise the program? You know, that again can be a discussion for for down the road for depending on what the board decides. Next slide. Uh, thoughts on third party RAN programs. It would likely need to be a one time relief. It'd be pretty difficult to operate with a third party to get monthly bill discounts going. Um, it could run purely from customer donations. It could be a combination of customer donations and district donations. And then you run into the how important is program oversight by the district. Um, you know, some of these places partner with, you know, United Way or, or different things like that. And I kind of wonder what type of control they have. My guess is you don't have a whole lot of control other than, than partnering with them and being able to help designate funds to them. Um, third, like I said before, a third party benefit, um, it does encourage, you know, the tax deductible aspect of it. Next slide. What are other agencies doing? Um, Lira programs or some sort of discounted rate programs. It's most commonly found in cities and counties. Um, the majority of public water agencies such as ours do not have Lira programs in place, but some certainly do. A lot of this all goes around that whole, if we can't use our water or sewer rate revenue, it would have to be a non-rate revenue. Um, we do have some of those options. Other agencies may not, which is why it's not as, as common. Um, below are four examples of agencies. Um, the Calaveras County Water has about 13,000 water customers. Their program allows 200 in the program with a $20 discount on their bi-monthly bill. Um, so their program costs them about $24,000 per year. They keep it high level, just stating that it's funded by non-rate revenue. Coachella Valley has 109,000 customers. They administer it through a third party, um, through donations and some funding from the district. Theirs is a $100 credit once per year option. El Dorado Irrigation has about 41,000 customers. Their program is for sewer only. They allow up to 1500 in the program with a $25 discount on a bi-monthly bill. Um, so that's a $225,000 program. And from what I read, they maxed out within a few months um, at their number of applicants. Uh, also, there's a funded by non-rate revenue. Scotts Valley recently started their pilot program. Um, they give a 30% discount on the basic meter fee and charge the flat tier one rate to residential customers. So a person using 6,000 or less gallons of water, um, they'd be getting about a $23.42 discount on their bi-monthly bill. Um, they state that theirs is funded by their property tax revenue. And when I spoke with them within the last couple of weeks, um, they had only four customers enrolled. Um, they do have it posted on their website, but they don't proactively, you know, advertise it. And last slide. So any final comments, you know, based on this discussion, um, I'm assuming this is gonna be going back to a committee. I believe we have been discussing starting committees up in June again. Um, but this kind of at least opens up the conversation for the board to discuss some of the different avenues that they think would be most feasible for our district. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Very well done. Uh, okay, any, uh, any questions or comments or thoughts on the subject from the board members? I'll go first. Lou, okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Stephanie and the friends of SLV Water, as well as other ratepayers that have made their comments known about this subject on the, the, the uh, SLVWD website. Uh, it's been really helpful, at least for me. Uh, I support a LIRA program, uh, particularly a, a one with a modest start and one that is legally viable and helps most deserving ratepayers. But after having a discussion with Stephanie about, about the financing and the particulars, uh, something came to my attention and that is that I was assuming that the property tax revenue we get, which is, a, which is approximately $800,000 a year, is not a steady uh, flow of revenue. Uh, there, a few years ago, they stopped the contribution for a while, I believe it was because of some financial hardships with the uh, library system. But the bottom line is that that's not a guaranteed amount of money. And given that, and, and, and since that would be the, the basic funding source, uh, because we can't use ratepayer money, um, I would hate to start a program and then have to stop it when we no longer had the property tax revenue. So I'm recommending that we basically hit the pause button for six months. And hopefully by then we'll be able to determine a clearer picture of our financial future and therefore what we can support in, in terms of the Alira program. Thank you, Lou. Anybody else with a comment? Yes. Or a comment? I do. Go right ahead, Lois. Thank you. I saw your virtual blue hand. <laughs> I um, actually talked to our supervisor about AB 401 and he got back to me and he gave me the name of someone who's supposed to know all the information and he gave me a phone number, which of course didn't work. <laughs> and um, so I called him back and left a message. And today um, I found a message on my machine from his office. And I, I'm gonna have to call them again because um, I it was too late to get a hold of anybody when I saw the message. Uh, so I'm hoping I can get some answers from uh the person he's directing me to. The other thing is, yeah, property tax. I, I was, when I was on the Long Pico board for a couple of years there, we didn't get any property tax uh, because of, I have no idea. I can't remember the reason. Hmm. I was also thinking maybe we need to do just kind of a, a test program. <coughs> say, um, okay, $25,000, uh, 208 customers, that would be $10 a month or $120 for the year and see how that goes. Just do a test program. Don't uh, just jump in and... <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm not making some people really happy here. I'm not against uh, doing something for low-income people, but I want to do it smartly, carefully, and this has come up time and time again, and there are issues about how it gets funded, who uh, gets the money to the rate payers, how much uh, burden on staff it might be, or do we go outside? It, it's a big issue. And I, I would like to see this done. I'm supportive, uh, but let's be careful. 
Thanks, Lois. Any other uh, comments, questions? I mean, I'll go. Uh, oh, Rick, go ahead. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I fully support a program that helps people in need uh, with their water bills. Um, and this is a program that is trying to do that. So I'm fully supportive of that. Uh, I wanna make sure that the most needy are the ones that are helped. And however, whatever number that is that we can afford, but it's the most needy, not first in line. I'm, I'm not in favor of a first come first serve approach to this. And um, if it has to be uh, modified from the care program, I mean, we've had a couple of issues with PG&E here most recently about their billing of us for the power outages and now with the environmental uh, concerns about the fires. And now we're gonna use PG&E as a, a model. So I'm a little reluctant to do that, uh, but I understand um, you know, its efficiencies perhaps. Um, and so one of the things about reaching out to people, I noticed there was a, a, a comment in there is I think this is why I wanted to support uh, the chatterbox uh, that we just funded uh, last meeting is these are this is what we need to do. We need to go out and target uh, the people that um, are most in need. So I believe we can use this outreach uh, component with uh, the chatterbox. Um, I'm in favor of doing this at. Uh, mm -hmm. And well, here it's first that I have a question that maybe Rick or Stephanie can answer. Is currently we have uh, no cutoffs of water uh, because of not paying bills. So in effect, we do have a low income assistance program working right now. Is that's correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so we can categorize it as that, right? So uh, I don't know how long we can continue doing that, but um, as numbers come in that will make it clearer for an analysis. Um, and as far as this, you know, this, the state, and you know, this is not just a, a local problem, it's a, a national problem, and it's not a, a total state problem. So I would hope that um, the state has said they're interested in doing this, and they need to be pressured into doing this at the fastest pace we can uh, help them do. So I would I like Lois's approach to talking with the representative and if we need to do more of that, we should do that. Uh, that's basically where I stand, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, any other thoughts from anybody? If not, I'll share mine. So I, I agree with, uh, I agree with, all of you right now, uh, all the other directors that have spoken so far. Uh, and I think it, one of the, I mean, uh, low cost assistance, yeah, that's that's fine. I, I certainly support that. And I'm really curious to see that since the state has gone to the effort of, of uh, this AB 401, and that it's at the point now where it's, it's uh, in maybe two years behind its schedule, but at least now we're in a situation where it looks like they might actually do something with it sooner rather than later. I would be inclined to let the state who's gonna be doing something with a mandate anyway, and forcing us to adhere to it, wait and see what they do. Uh, and then and then see what that what impact that's gonna have on us. As you pointed out, Rick, when we passed the resolution to not turn off anybody's water at the last meeting, that pretty much is a, a, a little program to some extent. Uh, so nobody, none of the people that were impacted as, as low income or anybody that may have been recently affected by uh, layoffs uh, as a result of the, the COVID crisis, um, it doesn't seem like there's anything that we need to jump on immediately or to take immediate action other than what we already did at the last meeting. So for that reason alone, and the fact that 401 is in process to some extent, I'm, I'm leaning towards Lou's suggestion of let's do nothing for six months and watch it. And also during that period, we'll also see what additional impact 
our community is going to have with the result of the layoffs, because I don't know where it is or how it's impacted our uh, 8,000 connections yet. And if it's significant impact, then that may cause us to rethink exactly what type of program and how we want to put it in place and, and manage it. So um, those are my thoughts, given where we are today with what we know about the, the COVID crisis, et cetera. Uh, any other comments from any director? If not, we'll go to the uh, public and uh, let the public comment. So for all those 16 attendees we've got, the first hand that went up that I saw was Tina, two. So Tina, you are promoted to the top of the list. Thank you. Um, I'm also in support of a LIRA program. I think it's a good idea. Um, however, I also understand the unfunded liabilities and the other um, fifth financial issues the uh, district is going through. So any LIRA program I feel like should be um, done responsibly with um, like fiscally responsibly. However, I don't think that there should be a cap on like the number of residents that you allow to give applications to because then it does become a first come first serve. I think that we should definitely target the lower income individuals and um, that they will, I don't wanna say self-select, but uh, the idea is that you'll, you'll end up with a, a, with a cap just based on income alone. Um, so I don't think that a cap on the number of applications is a good idea because I think it would ex exclude people who maybe move into the district who, you know, aren't familiar with the program. Uh, the other thing I disagree with you about is that I don't think you should take a wait and see six month approach. I think that the people who maybe can't pay their bill right now, uh, when that bill comes due or when you ever you decide that you're going to start collecting for those, then um, I, they're not going to be able to pay it then either. It'll c accumulate over months. And I feel like if you send out a lifeline to some of these people now versus six months from now, you're going to have a better response. And I, I, I just think that that's, it's unfair to wait on six months for the people that need it now. And um, yeah, so that's, that's my point. Okay, thank you, Tina. Uh, next with uh, comments from uh, Lauren, you're the next blue hand I see. Or Lauren. Lauren. Oh, it's Lawrence, Larry Ford, sorry. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, here I am. Yeah, I was changing um, name to Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. I thought maybe there was somebody else there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank all of you directors and staff for working on this problem. I think it's a really, it's a really important one. And I, I appreciate that you're even interested. Just a couple of comments. Um, I think it's really important to focus on who really is needy. That's come up before, but clearly neediness is not is not uh, necessarily limited to what their income level is. Um, and so I'm not sure how to resolve that problem, but uh, I think that's really what we're looking at is who are, who are the people that are really hurting. Anyway, and then I wanted to reiterate the, my suggestion that the district staff focus on what kind of grants they can get. They might not be able to get grants for a LIRA program but they might be able to get grants for other projects, which would offset other costs and make other funds available for things like this. The problem that I see is I don't know who your grant writer is now. Um, it's a lot of work to do a lot of grant writing, but I think that would be something that uh, potentially could be really valuable to the district. So um, that, those are my suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Okay, and uh, next up, uh, James Mosier. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Thank you all. Again, I'd like to reiterate what Larry said. I really appreciate the board's interest and support for moving forward on this. Um, I just want to have, I have a, a few clarifications. Um, uh, in terms of the funding, it's right that the, you do have $825,000 in property tax that can be variable, but this program could be funded out of other non-operating revenue. And I believe that that won't be a problem long-term. You may have to move to some of the other account. In terms of uh, the delayed uh, cutoffs that the, that the, um, that the uh, district has done so far, which I support strongly, it doesn't really constitute in my mind a LIRA program for this reason. You're simply delaying the cutoffs and delaying the need to pay the bill. Um, and at some point, the district's gonna have to say, well, you've got to pay up. And that's when the LIRA program would be kicking in. Uh, some sort of LIRA program to be helping people. It's not just the delay we're talking about, it's talking about really helping folks. The third thing is uh, I am not uh, at all, um, I, I've looked at, I've read the, the uh, state report and the, the, the um, looking at what uh, the state is, look, uh, is thinking about in terms of doing a statewide LIRA program. I've talked to our uh, assembly person about it. Um, it needs a two thirds vote of the legislature. This is a major, major hurdle for anything getting out of the legislature, as you know. I don't think we should be waiting to see what the state does. I think we should be taking the lead of other uh, local agencies that realize that in the meantime, as long as we have the means to do it, that we need to be helping people. We can anticipate in the next six months to a year we're going to have many ratepayers that need this kind of help. Uh, and I'm very sympathetic to what Rick Moran said about relying for on PGE for anything. But in talking with our uh, the water the water board staff and in researching the other programs, um, relying on the care uh, program at PGE, it's a it's a it's a very straightforward thing. The pg e does the staff work to determine who is available, who's got the, whose income matches this. It would greatly reduce the staff time needed to institute a program for us to rely on it. If you uh, try to do some other way of determining um, eligibility, the staff costs are gonna go way, way up. And the program, you're gonna end up spending a lot of money on staff time rather than on helping people. So. I, uh, those of us in the Friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water, uh, after looking at this carefully, decided that was really the way to go. Um, and I'm not sure if um, Cynthia Denzel is going to be talking. I'm not sure if she's on. If she is, I'm taking, uh, she can reinforce what I'm going to say next, which is that she has talked to, I think, the only 501c3 agency in the Valley um, who I think would be viable for doing this, and that's the the Valley Churches United. Uh, and in fact, they have an informal program right now. Uh, and um, there have been some donations to them specifically to help folks who are in need of emergency funds to avoid a cutoff because of uh, unexpected financial problems. Um, but they are, have very limited staff. They don't want to take on anything major on this. Um, it would take some discussion with them. Uh, but there is uh, there is some hope for that. But that for uh, those of us who have looked at this, uh, that is just one piece of the puzzle. The more important piece is the Lira program, such as the ones uh, that Stephanie described in other districts, where there's a there's a discount. The same as what PG&E does for low-income people, uh, uh, PG&E rates. They give a very significant discount, and we're hoping that uh, the district can move forward in this. Uh, it does need a deliberate process. Uh, I'm glad it can go to committee. I think you need to move on it now. I, I like um, Lois's idea of a pilot program to get it, just to get to figure out how to do it so that when people's needs really come forward in the next six months to a year, we have something that's uh, gonna really uh, address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, public comments?
And James, I saw you. Thank you very much. I'm I'm not ignoring you. Uh, Cynthia, you're up. Had a boy, James. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, you must be with me. I want to thank all of you for your thoughtfulness about this. I think all of the concerns raised are really valid and we all share those concerns. I feel from talking to Stephanie, I'd like to have more information from Stephanie about the need that she observes, um, what the district sees, how many people, the um, kinds of issues that need to be addressed among ratepayers. And it's difficult to do that without getting into privacy issues, but I think that staff can guide us on where we should put our efforts and whether this is something that needs to be addressed immediately or can wait for a while and just what options they would prefer to see. So I, I did talk to Lynn Robinson at Valley Churches United and um, they have also had their operations interrupted by COVID because they have to be careful also about you know, distancing from clients and that um, she told me that did slow down their ability to take applications. <clears throat> so I think all of us, um, everyone involved is trying to feel their way through this. So we just need to, maybe if the committees can meet and it can be handled um, through the committees to keep thinking about this working, as Jim said, towards, um, <clears throat> you know, a more permanent program, that would be helpful. Thank you, Cynthia. Any other um, comments from anybody? Elaine, oh, we're coming up here. Elaine, uh, Fresco. Hi, yes, I, I just wanted to um, also uh, uh, confirm or, or uh, Lois's suggestion and, and what Jim said about having a test program, um, just to get it going and see how it works out. Um, sending it to committee, I think is a good idea. I don't agree with you, Lou Ferris, about waiting for California because, well, look, it took them two years just to write a report. and. Um, they have a lot of other things on their plate right now. So I think just starting a small test program for us would be um, very valuable. That's it. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Beth, you are next on the blue hand list. Beth Thomas? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in uh, pursuing some kind of a program that will provide some relief for members of the community who, who have uh, economic difficulties. Um, my concern about having a temporary program, you know, trying it out, is that I think that that will become very confusing to people who uh, would need to take advantage of that program. I can't imagine how you would say, well, we're going to do this program and then all of a sudden have to pull the plug on it or something. I think we'd have to think that one through. Um, but I do support the idea of having a program that would provide some help for people who need it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next blue hand I see is Mark Dolson. Hi, Mom. Yep. Thanks, I wanna echo everyone's appreciation of, of the excellent work that the staff and, and the board have done on this. And um, and um, I don't wanna repeat everyone else. So the only thing I'll add or reiterate is that, you know, I think as you continue to deliberate, there's there's always the temptation in a difficult 
uh, situation to just postpone your decision. I, I don't understand any really good basis for saying, well, let me just think about it in six months. Maybe I don't need to think about it at all. I think you, you have to make a decision and uh, it's your decision, but um, I, I think it's, a, it's a, <laughs> just fooling yourself if you say, well, I, I support it and I'll think about it in the future. F figure out what you wanna do. That's my input. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I'd like to just clarify one point. Uh, hang on, hang on, Lou. Let's get back to, we got another citizen here. We'll go in order. April Zilber. Hi, thank you. Again, I'm so glad that the board is considering a Lyra program. And I do think it's important, as other people have already said, not to wait too long, but to take it to committee now and start working on some of the questions that were brought up in the earlier presentation because exactly this is going to happen. People who still have work now are not going to have work in a few months or people whose payment is in arrears and you, you're not turning off their service, but at some point in the future, you're going to say, start paying us. There does have to be something in place to help those people. So I would really appreciate it if the board moves forward with exploring the options and committing to doing something sooner rather than taking a wait and see approach. And a pilot program might be fine. Um, I don't really have an opinion about whether it should be a pilot or not at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other public input? If not, Lou, would you like to clarify your point? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I obviously wasn't clear, so let me clarify that I do not support waiting for the state. I think that would be a mistake. Um, there's no telling when that might be resolved, if ever. What I do advocate waiting for is a stable revenue source. And I'm hoping that in, in say six months, we will know whether or not our property tax revenue will continue to be stable or not, because that's a big deal. If we can't rely on those property tax monies, I don't know where we're gonna get the money to be able to support a program like this, although we might eventually find it. Um, so it's really not a matter of waiting for the state, it's a matter of making sure we have the money to start something so that we don't start it and then stop it. I think that would be a disaster. So that's, that's just a little clarification on and I do believe that it's, it's uh, reasonable to send this back to committee and further uh, work on it, not lose the time, just not put the money in the budget until we're sure that it's a stable money source. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Bob? I had, had um, uh, one comment and one question. So, um, you know, programs like this that are that are sort of rate support programs are uh, really most effective at scale. Um, and one of the challenges I think that, you know, we face, particularly when compared to a lot of the other ones that were examined is our really, really small scale. Uh, Scotts Valley, of course, has fundamentally different economic demographics than, than we do. And that also, um, helps them at one level. Um, with, res with respect to the legislature in terms of getting to that scale, because clearly a statewide program is the scale, um, you know, the, the legislature, the House is at 75% Democratic majority, the Senate at 72.5%, both well above the required two-thirds vote re um, to do this. And certainly with the number of people who are losing jobs, um, uh, you know, there's there's uh, going to be an urgent need, not just, you know, in our area, but in Los Angeles and San Francisco and the other areas that are much more heavily populated. Um, this is uh, something that I hope the state legislature can look at uh, and very quickly uh, adopt something. Um, that said, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of taking it to committee and let's dive into it in, the, in, in, a, uh, in a more a comprehensive fashion than, than we can do here. Um, one question for Gina. 
Um, legally, Gina, is there any way to target specifically those most in need or are programs like this really first come first serve to whatever caps are put on the program? Uh, well, I think it's not an, an either or. Um, That's good. But uh, in terms of determining financial need, I, I think the most significant difficulties are the ones that were identified, which is the administrative burden of figuring out, you know, what constitutes financial need and then how to determine eligibility. And that's where uh, the state water board recommended relying on the PG&E CARES information um, in order to make that determination so the district wouldn't have to. So that, I mean, that aspect of the program doesn't have to be dependent on um, you know, the number of people that the district can take or whether you know, getting in is done on a first come first serve basis or but, not. I mean, they, but, they could be independent determinations. But if, but if we did decide to go down the PG CARES route, we would really not be able to say we're gonna target those most in need. It would be whoever comes in with a PG and E care um, approval to whatever well, cap, right. to whatever that's cap, right. if any, we put on the program. That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, terrific. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what are we gonna do with this? Issue. I, I have my hand up again. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't paint it blue. Go right ahead, Lois. I just want to say the reason I suggested a pilot program is the very opposite reason of what Beth was saying. Um, I feel like if we just jump in and say, hey, this is what we're doing, blah, that then if it doesn't work, people are gonna say, gee, you promised me X amount of dollars. If we have a pilot program, keep it small, see how it goes, that perhaps um, we would get a good idea of the best way to go forward and people wouldn't be necessarily expecting uh, the, the money. The other thing is um, I talked uh, also to Anna Eshoo, our, our uh, congresswoman for our area, and I said to her, um, what, what's going to happen if people can't, I said, our water district is running just like it normally does, but what if we don't get money? And she was saying, well, we're thinking next stimulus bill may be help for, uh, for utilities. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are getting the $1,200 they were promised, let alone getting money to utilities. But there's all kinds of ideas out there. And I went out today and I saw more cars and people out that I've seen in two months. And I'm hoping that maybe things are gonna turn around by June, I don't know. I hope spring's eternal for me. I think people are just pissed off at staying in their houses, Lois. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a couple of suggestions here. We need to give the staff some suggestions or guidance as to what we would like them to do. Steve? Yeah? Yeah, I have a public comment. Who's talking? Mark. Mark Lee? Uh, yeah, uh, I think you already commented, Mark. What do you have? Do you have something significant to? Yeah, it wasn't on this, wasn't on this topic at all. Pardon me? I was not speaking on this topic at all. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I am absolutely amazed at the uh, uh, creativity and the brilliance of the uh, friends, of, the friends of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, putting that report together and leading the uh, charge. I want to uh, uh, give my hat off to uh, you know James Mosier, Tina Toe, Cynthia Denzel, 
Elaine Fresco and Beth Thomas, Mark Dolson, and April Zerbar for their their good research on this. And I, I, I think just the opposite. I think the board is being too conservative. I think we should move forward with a program ASAP. We have 30 million people unemployed. The, the COVID virus is not going away. In fact, it's gonna get worse. So I have a totally different thing. People are not being able to afford this program. Our, our water rates are increasing 5% a year. You have an existing budget of 10,827,750, which is increasing to 5% in 2020 to 11 million. This only represents a subsidy of literally 1.7%. I don't think we should even rely on property tax. I think we should move forward and get this program initiated using the CARE model. I don't know what so, uh, everyone is worried about. Um, this is a drop in the bucket. There are a lot of people that are struggling to pay their regular water bills as they go up 5% per year. So I'm in favor of not slowing down the process, but immediately taking a proposal before the district committee and getting a program initiated ASAP. And I think it's waiting for the, the assembly to come up with a, a strategic plan statewide is folly. They're gonna drag their feet on this for years. Uh, they, they, I, I, after talking with assemblyman Mark Stone, he said, this, would, this may take another year or two to implement. So I, I would not rely on our state assembly. We need to act individually and independently for our own ratepayer. And I don't think it's gonna be a difficult process to do. I think we can use the CARE program that's already up and running. And I do not think we should hesitate. Let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, back to the uh, the board for with respect to direction for the staff. Does anybody want to offer a suggestion at this point? What I'm hearing from most of you that we were discussing this is the fact that we should probably put it into a committee or send it to a committee and let them study the details that have been provided by the uh, the Friends of Fill in the Blank organization and the research that Stephanie has done and compiled with, with this. And also uh, the, a little more time will help us understand the, the conditions of our own valley a little bit more and uh, the other impacts that we might see down the road. Uh, I do think if we can get the committees coming back in June, that would be plenty of time. One of the, one of the uh, uh, suggestions I would have to the committee and to staff in, currently would be, since we are in the mode of not turning off people's water, and we know that there are some people who probably will um, have a large balance at, in three months or in six months from now, that we develop some sort of a program to specifically address that condition, which we know is likely to occur, um, as well as, or in conjunction with, the whole Lyra concept and program going into committee. And I assume it's budget and finance would be the appropriate committee to deal with this. So what do you all think, fellow directors? I think that's a great idea. Thank you. I, I agree too. And we can, I can work with the chair of the finance committee, uh, Ms. Henry, and put this together and get it agendized uh, for that committee. And we may, once we get back and running in June, we might even be able to have a second meeting to kind of catch up and to get these, uh, these important items through. Great idea. Uh, Rick? Rick, speak up. Steve, I, I liked uh, everything you said there. So I agree that it uh, should go uh, into the committee. I uh, support exactly what you said. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. Uh, wonderful. So we don't, uh, okay. Anybody else, any other director got a comment? No. Okay. So, so that's the guidance, Rick. We don't need to vote on this, right? No, we'll take it right back to committee and, uh, I'll meet with, uh, chair Henry. We can get this going and, uh, get it to, uh, the committees. 
Wonderful. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank uh, you very Stephanie, much. Uh, let me ask quick the finance manager, do you want to add anything to that, uh, Steph? Or does that sound good to you? I we should get her. I yeah, I think I think taking it back to committee, we can dive into it a little bit more and focus in on which type of route we can, you know, we can kind of lay it all out a little bit better. Right. And because, you know, we are monitoring our current accounts closely. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, positive with our rate payers paying their bills right now. I know it's early. Um, and then that'll give us a, a little bit more time to, to, to prepare more information. Great. Okay. Moving on. Last item on the agenda tonight. And uh, Rick? Okay, uh, I am uh, 5C, uh, this is the, the proposed rate increase. Uh, this is a, a recommendation uh, that the board review the information and staff's recommendation is to adopt a motion to proceed with the prior approved rate increase to take effect in uh, 2020. You have some alternatives uh, to freeze or stop the approved 5% rate increase from taking effect in 2020, to freeze or stop half of the approved 5% rate increase or two and a half percent from taking effect in 2020, uh, you could take uh, no action. Uh, staff does not recommend alternatives one and two because they would have significant long-term negative impacts on the financial health of the district. As briefly summarized in this memo, uh, staff does not recommend alternative three because a final board decision regarding this issue is needed in conjunction with finalizing uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, a little background, uh, according to the AB 401 final report recently released by the State Water Control Board, uh, drinking water is a basic, basic human need. Expenditures to meet basic water needs are expected to continue to rise rapidly due to the need for water systems to replace aging infrastructure, uh, meet treatment standards, uh, diversity uh, or uh, diversify uh, supplies and maintain a well-trained workforce. A number of factors explain the rising rates for water service, three of which are relatively unique to, to water among the basic service sectors. First, water has been historically underpriced compared to the true cost of service, leading many water systems in, in California to underfund or to put off infrastructure maintenance, replacement, and other uh, critical activities. Second, increasing stringent water quality standards also require additional costs for treatment and operator training, which uh, further stress financial uh, capabilities. Third, the percentage of federal support in total public infrastructure, infrastructure spending for water utilities have fallen from 30% in the 1970s to less than 5% in 2015. In other words, water systems must uh, finance their own operations to a much greater extent than in the past. In 2017, there was a study that found that the district's cost of water service would increase from approximately 9.7 million uh, in 2016-17 uh, to 10.6 million in 2020-2021. In order to meet its revenue requirement, the district undertook a Proposition 218 process in 2017 and ultimately approved a water rate increase to be phased in gradually over five years. The upcoming uh, year uh, four increase would be 5% going into effect with bills in November, 2020. Year five is also scheduled to be 5% taking effect in uh, 2021. Uh, on an overview, the attached rate schedule and scenarios project for the next five years of revenue and expenditures below summarize revenue uh, that permanently would be lost to the district from stopping or freezing uh, the scheduled rate increase. Uh, I do believe there is a income projections for rate increase uh, attached to this memo. Uh, the lost revenue would compound uh, and be much greater over time frames, longer than the next five years, unless the district approves catch up rate increases. A continuing with prior approved rate increases would help to ensure financial health for the district in the face of possible revenue losses due to COVID 19. Uh, anticipated losses and expenses related to wildfire risks and management, uh, compliance with stringent regulatory requirements and the need to maintain aging infrastructure. Also, these funds can uh, 
be used to reduce other long-term liabilities and or uh, future water infrastructure capital projects. Uh, just a little background, this item was requested uh, by Chair Swan to be put on the agenda and other directors is why it, it is on this agenda as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the Chair Swan for questions. There is a, uh, like I said, there is a spreadsheet there. Uh, we do have the finance director still uh, attending the meeting and she'd be more than happy to answer any questions or I could ask if she would like to add anything additional. Uh, she could feel free to. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer, but essentially I think it is essentially showing the compounding effect of when a rate increase doesn't occur, how quickly that can add up. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay, uh, blue hands are popping up, I don't, uh, Rick. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess this is for Stephanie. Stephanie, could you give me maybe some specifics on what are the long-term negative impacts uh, on the financial health of the district if we don't do this? Some, I just need some concrete examples of what you think those impacts are. I mean, it's for the least amount one, it's 1.3 over five years. That's $1.3 million that could be used proactively to reduce our unfunded liabilities and have direct longer term interest savings from our CalPERS pension like we were discussing. Um, it's being able to accelerate or fully fund some of the other deferred maintenance programs that we know we have on the horizon. I mean, pretty much every item that we talked about at this meeting so far all involves money. And we pretty much are coming in with this fiscal year 2021 budget. Wow. We're coming in, we're coming in break even, which means if we wanted to go do some of these programs, we really wouldn't be able to without taking out of reserves. So I mean it 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 could be used for a lot of different things. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. So I, I, I'm going to share a comment then uh, before I call on Bob. Number one, I hate Proposition 218. I think it's a license to steal. And every time the Water District has pulled that card out of the deck over the last 10 years or so, it's been extremely aggravating to me and a number of other rate payers. Um, you know, I I just, I mean, I'm in favor. I mean, one of the things, and this goes back to the platform that some of us ran on to get elected was stop giving away money, which we've done a good job of that, and to roll back or attempt to roll back the rate increases, which we haven't addressed at all until this potential opportunity. I'm almost of a mind to say vote them down completely, no rate increase. And, and force the district to live within its means, you know, within the budget it's got, within the revenue it's got, and to can seriously pursue those new revenue opportunities that, uh, that have been mandated at the beginning of this year. Um, so I'm just, I, I mean, having been a realist also, having been on the board now for a year and a half, I see the realities in the expenses and realize that, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of these unfunded mandates or liabilities that exist and there's operating expenses and there's a crappy infrastructure that I've been allowed to go on for far too long. And so I hate the idea of pulling out uh, a rate increase that's going to be used wisely. But then again, I'm not 100% sure about that either. Just my rambling thoughts on the subject of the rate increase because we haven't addressed it in the first year, and I wanted to wait until we got a little better uh, footing before bringing it up and talking about it again or addressing it. But um, this is some thoughts right now. I'll have more later. Bob, please share your uh, thoughts and comments with us. Well, I wanted to um, 
talk a little bit about historical challenges that boards have faced in the past. Whenever there's been a Prop 218 uh, process, certainly the last two, for the most part, all of the increased revenue has gone for increased operating expenses, with, with very little of that having been used to expand the amount of money that's available, the margin, that is the operating revenue minus the operating cost, the margin available to deal with some of these very critical uh, challenges we have. And the unfunded and underfunded liabilities aren't just the pensions and the OPEB, it's the tank maintenance, it's the meters, it's the 150 million, which is our guess, of uh, infrastructure that has to be replaced over 50 years, which is 3 million a year. It's the 30 years looking back that was not addressed in a sustainable and systematic fashion that we have to catch up on. It's the Lyra program. It's uh, pump maintenance. It's um, the, uh, uh, the entire totality of, of what is in, in front of us. And we have yet to put that all, the, we've got pieces of it now, but we have yet to put that all together. Um, and so that's one side of the equation. That is, we, de we do definitely need to be putting more money towards, oh, I forgot about the reserves. We do not have our reserves fully funded yet either. So there's lots of places for money to go. What I'm looking at with this year's proposed budget, though, and I'm not sure I understand the concept of flat, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a $733,000 increase in operating expenses over what we're estimating for this year coming in at, and that was before uh, you know, the coronavirus really hit big time, and an estimated uh, $485,000 in revenue increase. So that means that this revenue increase is going entirely to increased operating expenses, which means that the margin that we're applying to uh, these unfunded liabilities is shrinking. It's actually going from 3.2 million, again, estimated actual for this year, to 2.9 million. This is exactly the bind that previous boards got into, that you do this rate increase and operating expenses eat it all up, and so there's not enough money available for, um, uh, for uh, those really critical things. So, I hope that we're gonna be able to keep making progress towards getting our hands around the unfunded liabilities. And, and you know, I really like to continue working with staff on that. Um, but if we're not going to do that, and we're gonna see this kind of operating expense increase just to run the district and the uh, revenue not even covering that so that we can just stay in place, then I'm not in favor of doing um, rate increases. And I think that would have to be coupled with also saying we're gonna do a flat expense budget as well. Um, that is, we're not gonna go up 10% in expenses and 4% in revenue. We're gonna do flat on both. Um, I think the economic fallout from this um, shutdown is going to be uh, longer term than we expect. The unemployment claims that have been filed in Santa Cruz County, now again, not just in our area, in two weeks exceeded an entire month during the uh, 2008 crisis. So we are definitely going to see a longer term effect. Um, at this point, I'm, I'm not in favor of either the operating expense increase or the rate increase until such time as we have a very clear picture of unfunded uh, uh, liabilities, a multi-year process by which we're going to commit to the community how we're going to address those, and a budget that reflects both in a very systematic and comprehensive fashion. And we are not there yet. Thank you, Bob. Any other director comments this time or questions? Steve, I'd like to have, say some words. Please. Yeah, go right ahead, Lou. Uh, first of all, to, to James. Um, okay, I, I put this item on the agenda 
and I could probably talk about this ad nauseum. So James, I'm gonna give you authority to put me on the clock and stop me at five minutes, okay? Moving right along. I've been thinking about this a lot in the last week. Hello? Yep, we hear you. Okay, I thought I lost you. I've been thinking about this subject a lot in the last week and I vacillated back and forth basically all week. And finally I stepped back, took a deep breath and reduced it down to some simple axioms. I thought about what I, what I promised myself when I was appointed to the board a year ago. And that was to follow some simple rules. Number one, always have the best interests of the ratepayers in mind. Number two, always listen to staff because after all, they are the subject matter experts. So towards that, and then thirdly, uh, is to listen to all ratepayers because everybody has good ideas. Um, number one, the interest of the ratepayers. By my reckoning, and correct me if I'm wrong, the rate increase this year will be the seventh increase in the last 11 years. And these have not been insignificant increases. As I look at the, the numbers from the uh, California State Water Resources Board, they say that the average water bill for Californians increased by 45% between 2007 and 2015. Well, they don't live in, in the San Lorenzo Valley. My water bill, and I have them right here, if anybody would like to look at them. In the last 11 years, my, my water rates have gone up by 345%. In a vacuum, that wouldn't be terrible. The problem is all of my utility bills have gone up, have gone up by a commensurate amount. And that's slowly eating away at my fixed income in retirement to where I might have to move out of California in less than five years. So I'm very attuned to, to the ratepayers in this valley. And you know, one other data point, uh, the first time we did the 218 process, there was a thousand protests. So the second time there was 2,500. Might we actually defeat the next rate increase, you know, considering that, 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 that Delta? I don't know, but I do believe that we're running into a, uh, a, a rate payer um, induced uh, I mean, we're getting tired of rate increases because they never seem to end. We never seem to give back to the people that keep this, this district going. Um, and I think the, the, abil the, um, the, the ability of ratepayers in the to absorb future increases is clearly diminishing. At the same time, I think, I talked with Stephanie about the numbers and she makes a very compelling argument. If we reduce the rate increase, we effectively reduce it forever. And, and that is that that really gave me pause and, and made me think that that maybe that's something that we can't do, especially with going, what's going on with the economy right now. So here's the, the last point, and that's on the, the other rate payers input. There was a, a, a rate payer that, that sent something to the board just yesterday that I thought had a pretty good suggestion. Her, her idea was doing a, a temporary rollback for say three months for all rate payers. That would be a one-time cost, not a continuing cost in the, and, and reduce our ability to raise money in the future. And I think that's something that's, that's worth considering uh, to again, think about what's in the best interest of the rate payer. But at the same time, you know, this is probably the worst time to think about foregoing a rate increase because I'm sure we're gonna find out far too late in the future that it was something that we desperately needed. So with having said all that, I would, I would suggest that we do some sort of rate increase similar to what that rate payer suggested as a one-time event and that's it. That's my suggestion. Thank you, Lou. Any, uh, any other directors with a hankering to make a comment? Me? Go right ahead. Okay. Well, I decided, I heard some comment about wasting money. Um, and I took a look back 
at what we have done, what this new board and new district manager has done uh, since December of 2018. Uh, one thing, we have an engineering department. It saves the district money. We have a professional registered engineer and an assistant engineer to facilitate capital improvement projects in-house with considerable savings to the district. We have a master plan that is being worked on and should be completed by the end of this year. Uh, all right, I can't even talk. Uh, Mainline replacements, identifying deficiencies within the distribution system and long range planning and financial forecasting. We have eliminated the lawsuits that cost this district so much money and did nothing to help. We've also reduced the attorney bills. The probation tank. The probation tank has been completed and upgraded from a 100,000 gallon tank to a 500,000 gallon tank. In addition to the, that, the district received a very prestigious award, the American Public Works Association for Environmental Sensitive Construction Projects. The swim tank. Um, the district moved forward with purchasing an alternative project site for replacement of the swim tanks in Van Loman. The alternative site has an estimated cost savings of about $500,000. In addition to the alternative site will allow us to put required amounts of storage to provide adequate fire flow. Fire management plan. We have a fire management uh, plan that we're moving forward with. The district has procured a consultant to start the process and is moving forward as part of the process. The consultant will be looking to apply for grants and lower costs to implement this program. Integrated pest management plan. The district is moving, uh, it, the district has developed a draft integrated pest. And we have also uh, have a public advisory committee for facilities. We have just voted to do a public outreach plan, plan with uh, Chatterbox. And we also just did a survey, a customer survey. We have a new website which is ADA approved, streamlining better search engines, more information, capital improvement uh, section to give customers an update on construction. Thanks to staff, we have a loan of $14,500,000, much better than the USDA loan 
that WSC was putting forward and charging us a fortune fund for. And one of the good things about the loan we got, we got all the money up front and it's in the bank and it's earning some interest. Granted, we're paying interest, but we're earning some interest on that. And, and that helps. Um, we have prohibited the use of glyphosate in, on district property. The Lion Tank Access Road. Lion Tank and the water treatment plant was damaged during heavy rainfall. The cost to fix that is going to be tremendous in millions of dollars. Granted, we have FEMA, but the district has to pay before you get FEMA money. So, and FEMA money is only out there for so long you get a date that they want you to be started. Um, we purchased uh, nine generators uh, to, and they're in the process of being installed as we speak. Um, the surplus property, Manana Woods is, as we speak, is getting a commercial property appraisal. Uh, the pipeline projects, which Quail Hollow, Lion, Sequoia, California Drive, that's all part of the five pipelines that are funded by the loan. Um, the revised Fall Creek fish ladder, it went from six inches to 12 inch steps, cutting the cost in half. Upper Ziani Stream wood enhancement project, which I believe was all paid by a grant has been finished. I don't think we've been wasting money. We've been proactive. I believe the water district needs to continue to move forward, not step backwards or stay in place. I think we need to uh, say what we wanna do about this rate increase because the budget is due next month. And I believe we need to say we're going ahead with the rate increase. We don't have to approve it. It's already been approved. I get what Steve said. I hate the 218 process also. Uh, it's almost impossible to stop a rate increase. What at this last rate increase, there was a huge, huge push by people in the district standing outside with protest letters for people to sign, bringing them in, bringing, but there were not enough. In fact, they were, they didn't even try to verify that all the protest letters were legitimate because some of them were duplicates, some of them people didn't live here. They didn't bother with that because they're just, it costs a lot of money and they fell well below the threshold to protest. So that's, that's my um, look at this. I think we need the right increase and we need to go forward. And if we get to September or even January, and, and things are not working, people can't pay or whatever, we can change and move the right and say, hey, we're gonna not do this right now, or, and we can uh, modify the budget at that point. The budget is not written in stone. That's it. Thank you, Lois. Any other uh, comments from any other directors at this time? No, okay, well, we can go to the, um, well, if, 
Yeah, well, we'll just go to the public. Any of the, uh, anybody uh, want to comment? Uh, James and uh, Mosier. Go right ahead. You need to me unmuted. You're you're not you muted, now? you're not muted right now. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity of talking to the board about what I think is a critical issue. Um, I first I want to um, uh, agree with Lois that this board has made some uh, good decisions in terms of cost savings, the hiring of an engineering staff, uh, and getting rid of that horrible lawsuit. Uh, both constituted good cost savings. It's the way you do cost savings as you identify where you're spending is not um, uh, optimum and you figure out how to do it more efficiently. It's a, uh, as a former director of a nonprofit, I learned the hard way how to do cost cuts. And the way you don't do cost cuts is to simply say, okay, we're gonna cut $400, $400,000 out of uh, a budget that's been developed like this and it all has to be done in an emergency. There is reasons why the budget, operating budgets is going up. You're doing a lot of work. You can look at this rate increase. I mean, you can look at the budget and you see somewhere around $440,000 of it going to increase costs for that loan. The loan was really important. The rate increase was, it, it was the rationale for it was exactly so you could get the loan so we could do the work that needs to be done. I think the idea of saying to staff at this point, you find however much it is, $350,000 of this budget and uh, make a cut between now and June it is a recipe, as Lois said, for taking a step back. Uh, we should go forward. This, you don't have to vote on this rate increase it's already been voted on. It's already there. We need that money. We're, the whole discussion at the beginning, my gosh, this district desperately needs uh, to continue to fund. That's part of the reason why the Friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water looked into the LIRA program because we were concerned about these rate increases and its impact on low-income people. That's why the LIRA program is so important. Um, it, as the state, as the state uh, report says, we can, it's gonna cost more. That's what we're looking at. Think about climate change, think about this COVID, uh, uh, the COVID impact of the COVID, all of this, my gosh. Um, those of us who can afford the rate increase, I am happy to pay a little bit more in order to make sure this district stay, stays financially healthy. So I strongly support the idea of simply going forward with the budget as proposed by the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tina, you're up next. I just wanted to reiterate um, Mr. Mosier's comments that I also support the both the lira and the rate increase. I think that it is imperative to the budget. And um, as a rate payer, I am willing to pay a little more in support of it. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Nancy Macy. You're still muted, there you go. Yeah, something got in the way of my marker. Sorry, Sorry. okay, thank you very much for the chance to talk on this issue. Um, I think it's imperative that you keep the rate in increase. Um, you've got so many things coming up and we have so much that's of undeterminate nature in the future because of the uh, pandemic that it would you'd be shooting yourselves in the foot. Um, look at what your staff has done. Trust your staff. They are very smart, intelligent, hardworking people who care about this district, who care about their jobs. And they've done a brilliant job in showing you why you need to keep this. And the things that Rick was reading, um, you know, that was for the whole state of California, that or the whole state. I guess it was the whole United States, Rick. But anyway, um, yeah, we're we're right up there with everybody else. And my husband and I are on limited income. We're retired. We're not out there, uh, you know, having to make money. And we're lucky in that respect. We do have some income. But, uh, you know, how long can anybody count on that? But we are willing and uh, grateful for the opportunity to keep our 
water district healthy. And I thank Lois for her rundown of that very interesting series of accomplishments. And um, go for it, you guys. Don't be scared. It'll work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Gelblum. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I listened to all this very carefully. I don't think I heard any director or staff member say we didn't need the money. Yeah. From the rate increase. Right. Um, I heard somebody say, I think it was Bob, that it was a campaign promise, or it might have been Steve, I'm not sure, that you ran on this. Well, you ran on reducing unnecessary costs, as, as Jim Mosher said, and, and you did that. You got rid of the litigation, you settled it under the, the, the rupture of attorney's fees. And I think pretty much everybody, including those of us who, who ran, you know, worked against you guys in the campaign, I think you did a good job of doing that. And that was smart and, and you got rid of that. But I, again, haven't heard anybody identify any cause that are in the budget that you think are unnecessary. The rate increase, as I understand it, is going to add an average of, or add for the average user, a dollar or two per month. Um, if people can't afford that, then the Lira program, or you've already put a moratorium on it, but it's not going to be many people who are going to be in a different position if they have to pay a dollar or two more per month for their water bill. If you think that there's some costs that need to be cut, that there are some excess costs in addition to what you've already gotten rid of, and you got rid of the fat. If you think there's some additional cost, I think it's an incumbent upon the people who think there are unnecessary costs to identify those costs. Staff has told you, and as, as, as Lou said, trust the staff. They're the ones who are doing this. This is their job. <laughs> they're the professionals in this. They've told you what they need. If you think they're wrong, then tell them where they're wrong. Tell them, look, you don't need this line item. You don't need this line item. We don't need to repair all the infrastructure. We don't need to maintain the infrastructure. We'll just let it all keep going down the drain uh, or whatever it is. But I you guys or women, whoever thinks you don't need the money, identify what you, the, the expense you don't need. Staff's already told you they think they need all this. They're not going to, how can they identify something they don't think they need? They think they need it all. So again, I think it's incumbent upon each of you who think that you don't need it to say why you don't need it by identifying costs beyond those you've already gotten rid of that, that can safely be cut and maintain the district's mission of delivering safe, reliable water at an affordable rate. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else? Uh, Cynthia, your hand is up. Can you hear me? Yes. I would like to say that in my own neighborhood, I see leaking pipes. I see crumbling roads. I really want infrastructure to be improved and it is not saving money if you let things deteriorate to the point where you pay much more. I really appreciate uh, Director Henry's listing of all the things you have accomplished. And to me, that's the argument for continuing with the rate increase so that you guys can continue to fund infrastructure repairs. Thank you. Thank you. April, you're next up. Thank you. I appreciate what Cynthia just said. It dovetails perfectly into what I wanted to say, and that is that we've had a low rainfall year so far, and I'm really concerned about fire. So it would be fabulous if we could keep moving forward with our tank repair and replacement and pipe repair and stuff so that there's enough water in case there is a fire in one of our neighborhoods. So I, I think we should stick with the rate increase the way it's already planned. Thank you, April. Uh, Gail? Thank you. Um, I also want to advocate um, proceeding with the 5% rate increase as planned. 
Um, I understand Director Fultz's concern that our operating expenses are rising at rates uh, greater than our revenues, but then it's his responsibility to identify what are those uh, expenses that he thinks we can uh, get rid of. Also, it doesn't make logical sense to say that um, because we are spending more than we're taking in in revenues, um, we can't uh, fund our, our long-term unfunded liabilities. And then uh, that's true, but then simply say, okay, we're not going to raise the rates. Um, secondly, not raising the rates, as I brought this up last time, is leaving money on the table. There's a lot of people in the Valley that can afford the average rate increase a month. It's basically me going down to the Raven and have one chai latte a month. I'm happy to give that up and send the money um, to the water district instead. And finally, the point I want to make is the danger of uh, not increasing the budget in one year. Steph made the very important point that it has this compounding interest effect in that it, even if you stop it for one year, you never can get that money back and you lose a lot of money down the road. And so it's really important to um, go ahead as planned if you need to help people at the low end with some Lyra kind of project, that, that's fine. Um, but it would be a, a terrible mistake to not go ahead with the rate increase now, and then we'd find ourselves five years down the road um, being $5 million in the hole because of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Dolson. Thank you. I agree with so much of what's been said. I'll try to say something a little bit different, which is that, as near as I can tell, virtually all of us agree that the district has looming expenses and the more revenue that's available to meet those, the better. I think everyone agrees that the board and the staff have, have done a number of, of outstanding things to, to, to move in the direction of improved efficiency and cost savings. And I think everyone agrees that, that we want to spend as little as possible. Every, everyone shares that goal. The, the, the uh, sticky point that I see is that I, I see a, uh, two directors, and I'm thinking of Bob and Steve right at the moment based on what you've said, asserting that we we can magically achieve that goal by just imposing by fiat uh, a limit on spending. And that's that's a matter of faith. And if, <laughs> I don't think I could shake your faith in that, but I don't, I don't think that's an evidence-based position. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Larry Ford. Thank you. I... I want to say that finally, I, I remember when uh, 10 years ago or so, the one of your predecessor boards made the decision not to go ahead with a rate increase. And it was, it was horrible because that, you know, we knew what the consequences of that was, was going to be. We were going to have uh, a delay in, you know, the repairs of, of infrastructure that was decaying and it just, uh, it was terrible. From from my point of view, a couple of dollars a month, a dollar a month, whatever it is, that's perfectly affordable because I put it into the context of how long we've been waiting to catch up on, on the deficit. And um, now we're finally making a lot of progress as Lois described and went on at great length. And I'm really pleased about that. And I'm really happy to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Elaine, did you already talk on this matter? If not, please go ahead and begin speaking. Um, hi, yeah, I'll make it short. Um, I just think that it would be very short-sighted to forego this rate increase. I know that uh, Director Foltz mentioned a couple meetings ago about the optics of, of the rate increase. And I just want to say, I think that uh, Lois Henry made a very good case that you already have very good optics and you, and it, it, it's not worth it to forego this rate increase just for how it will look because it's so important. Um, and I actually did not really understand uh, Director Fultz. You are saying that our operating expenses are increasing 
And for that reason, we shouldn't raise the rates. Uh, and, and, and you're also pointing out that we have very a lot of unfunded liabilities. I, I'm not great in accounting, but I don't understand that. So obviously, I am, I'm very happy to pay this rate increase. That's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I think we've all gone. No, Mark, make up your mind. Are you raising your hand or not? Okay, no more hands. All right, coming back to the uh, the board. All right, so uh, I don't know if anybody has any comments uh, in addition to what we've Could, heard. There's a lot. I make a motion. Uh, you can, uh, I was just going to say, Lois, before you make a motion, if that's what you'd like to do, uh, we don't have to do anything right now. Uh, uh, so we don't have to vote the freezer, stop it. We don't have to, uh, we can take no action if we choose to. Or we can vote to get knock it down. So those are three would, that we okay. have. Go ahead, Lois, make your motion. I would like to make a motion to keep the rate increase because we need to get this budget done and we need to have an answer. None of those three things were staff was not saying we should do any of those three things. And I, I agree with um, those who said, we need to trust our staff. And the reason we have a district manager is to give us information and we have a financial director. I'd like to make a motion that we keep the rate increase and get the budget done. Rick, your hand is up. Uh, yes, I wanted to make a comment. Uh, I'm quite willing to uh, second that motion uh, as long as I get an opportunity to make a comment about the subject of the budget. All right, I don't know. Let's ask uh, Gina. Are we in order or are we uh, stepping on our toes? It's appropriate for Director Moran to make a comment if he wishes prior to seconding a motion. Thank you. Go ahead, Rick. All right. Uh, so here I am trying to um, put my head around all this. A, a lot of this stuff is uh, new to me in the regard of I never paid attention to my water bill when I was going to school or 15 years ago. Um, but it uh, has become something that's important to me now. Um, so when I hear that the water, the price of water has been historically underpriced. All right, I'm gonna take that as a, an honest answer, all right? So that's part of maybe why um, other people have spoken about the, the large percentage that our water bills have gone up in the last few years, okay? So if it's underpriced, we're trying to catch up for, you know, uh, past policy, all right? So, um, Water is a top priority with me. So I would uh, gladly find other ways to save money to make sure that I have safe, reliable uh, water. And I think uh, Lois made a long and eloquent list of the things that this board has accomplished and all of those things require money. And I haven't seen this board misspend money. I've seen them be real tight with money. And I don't think um, they're being uh, frivolous with any of the money that's being um, budgeted. Um, the most, one of the most important things about uh, being on this board is, for me, is to being transparent. So here we are, we're talking about this. A lot of people have chimed in. It's a difficult situation to use this Zoom technology. 
but people are interested in doing this and we're talking about it up front and being honest with each other. And uh, it's been pretty civil, so I appreciate that. So uh, in that regard, I'm willing to um, second Lois's motion. Uh, okay. We have a second. And I'm just wondering, do we even need this vote? What's the purpose of it? We already have, if it's to keep the rate increase, we already have the uh, rate increase plan. Chair, Chair Swan, I think the purpose is that staff, we're going, the board seems to be going back and forth. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, on the fence, whether they're going to, uh, to stop the rate increase or whether to let, let the rate increase play out. And staff needs to know so we can adjust the budget or work these numbers into the budget. Um, I don't want to go back and forth every board meeting or every um, finance meeting up to November and be on the fence on the rate increase. And I think Stephanie, I mean, if you want to chime in on that, will agree with me that we'd like to put this item to bed because we're spending a considerable, and, and don't, don't get me wrong, it's a very, very important issue, but we're spending a lot of time on it and we're not making a decision. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to put this to bed and, and move ahead. It's difficult to put the budget to bed. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, okay, so we have a, uh, a second. Steve, I'd like to make a comment. Go ahead. I think that Rick has, has made a very good point. I think that's an, a good reason to proceed. Also, I'd like to ask Gina, point of order, there's been a motion and there's been a second. Don't we, aren't we required to, to fulfill that vote? Yes, there should be a vote taken. I think the point that was being made was, was a broader one, but you're absolutely right, Director Ferris, with a motion and a second, the matter should be voted upon. Then let's call for the vote. Go ahead, uh, Holly. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Steve. What, what is it we're voting on, right? <laughs> yeah, Holly, could you read back what the motion is? Oh. Thank you. Uh, Lois Henry made a motion to keep the rate increase and get the budget done. Thank you. Okay. President Swan? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Fulce? No. Beg your pardon? No. No. Director Moran? Yes. Director Ferris? No. Uh, three yeses, motion passes. Okay, well, thank you all very much for tuning in. This, uh, the hour of this board meeting has now uh, come to a close and uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>